We are live here at Myth Vision Podcast. Welcome back. Let's get the party started. Don't any of you have that guts to play for blood? I'm your huckleberry. That's just my game. Ladies and gentlemen, we are Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision. Dr. Richard Carrier, how are you today out there in the sun? Can you hear me? Your audio. Let's see if everything's... He, he, he's out in the sun, hanging out in the car, getting some nice uh, relaxation in the woods. So let's see. Can everybody hear him or is it just me? Dr. Carrier. <laughs> let's see. Is he writing me? We are live. Everybody in the chat, how are you doing? Okay, yes, he he cannot hear me. Huh. Weird. Let me try something and bounce out and back, back, come back. Let's see. Maybe I leave studio and come right back in. What happened to him? No. Can you hear me now? Dr. Carrier. He might have to bounce out and come back in. Let me see. I'm going to address you, everybody in the chat here in just a second. All right. He can't hear me. Back out and come back in. There he is. He got the gist. All right. How's everybody doing? I hope you're having a wonderful day. Let me go to the tippy. Uh, seems like there's been an argument going on for, I don't know, for quite some time. Ivana, Ivana, uh, talking about Dr. Carrier's misrepresenting the origins of Christianity or that the failure of prophecy in Daniel caused or potentially was what created the origin of Christianity. Are you there? Yes. <laughs> I, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. Uh, but there was a party started in the chat well before our live that's been going on for a long time. Oh, uh, wow. Okay. <laughs> lots of people. But I want to give shout out to everybody. Chris. Uh, is it New Choice? Yvonne, Ivana, Robert. Uh, James Apperson. Good to see you here. I appreciate it. Psychotic Nut. None Believer. Just shouting out to everybody. Melody Joy, always good to see you. Everybody who's been popping in here. Someone's first on the Facebook side. Sean Worley, looking forward to this. In his car. Yes, he is in his car. That's <laughs> the best place to be, isn't it? <laughs> it's another occasion for those who follow me on the internet and have seen a lot of my shows. Occasionally, the mountain I live on, we lose all comms, internet and cell. So I have to drive up to the top of the mountain to get LOS to a cell tower. <laughs> wow. So I'm on my iPhone uh, in my new RAV4. I just got rid of my old clunker and finally got an all-wheel drive that I needed because I live on a mountain and I need freaking all-wheel drive. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you. You got a new car. You got you to gotta break it in with uh, with episodes on Myth Vision. I don't blame <laughs> yeah. you one bit. Actually, yeah, you do have the honor of being the first episode of anything that I have shot from inside my RAV4. So <laughs> yes. It's a little advertisement for Toyota there. <laughs> Thank you for giving me the opportunity to take the car's virginity at this point. Uh, we have some super chats. We're taking your questions. If you have Let's any questions, yeah. you want to challenge Dr. Uh, Dr. Carrier, please do so. He is always down for the challenge, honestly. Um, you like to debate, uh, but obviously with people that, you know. Actually, I don't like to debate. I'm you just don't? Good at it. <laughs> 
I'm just good at it, so I'll do it. Um, usually, if I'm paid, but <laughs> that's the thing now. I get it. I get it. Yeah, you are pretty good at it. There's a lot of people who are like afraid to debate you, even if they think you're wrong. They're like, oh, I don't think I'll debate this guy on this. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's it's because I don't I don't let the rhetoric pass, right? So it's hard to maneuver and manipulate an audience when someone's calling out all your maneuvers and manipulations. Uh, so <laughs> I think that makes it difficult uh, for people. Yeah. Well, let's jump into this. We'll go ahead and start taking Q and a and having some fun. Um, there was already arguments going on in the chat. If someone wants to bring up those questions, feel free to do so. Um, first questions from Grays 174 and thank you for the support. Why is Mark 4, 10 through 13 a hint that the whole gospel is a parable? When this story retold in Matthew clearly states that it was a reference to Isaiah 6, 9. Yeah, I mean, that's actually the same thing, right? Uh, so uh, I think Mark is intentionally referencing Isaiah as well. Uh, th that's basically they're saying that this, this is their scriptural precedent for this, right? It's saying that this is why we're, we get to teach you this way through allegory, telling you stories, but the real meaning is hidden beneath the story. People who take the story literally are the outsiders, the ones who are damned, who aren't going to get it. And it's only the people who get taught secretly, as Jesus says, you know, only those, I'm going to take you aside and I'm going to tell you the real meaning of these stories. Um, the scriptural authorization for that method of teaching is coming from Isaiah. And I think that's also what we find probably like in the Qumran scrolls too, this idea of secret teachings they often reference uh, biblical precedents for why that is an acceptable way to proceed, the, the hidden messages approach of Pesher logic. Uh, and the way Mark puts this story in there, you wonder, like, why is he even doing this? You remember, like, Paul does not have uh, parables. Paul doesn't seem to know anything about the parables of Jesus. I suspect that those didn't exist. I think the idea of teaching through parables is an invention of Mark, and I think he's doing it so that he can illustrate what he's doing over, overall. Uh, it, it's basically the, this a model for how you're supposed to approach the whole gospel, and he's cluing you in in chapter four. And the best defense of this take on the gospels, and this isn't actually a non-mainstream view. There's a lot of scholars who actually agree with this, um, but the best one is John uh, John Crossan's book, uh, "The Power of Parable," uh, is the best sort of really approachable defense of like, yeah, actually the gospels are just extended parables. Uh, and, and that's actually a method of teaching that was very popular back then. So it's actually not even unusual. Hmm. Thank you so much for that, Grays. That's an interesting question to think about. I really appreciate that. Chris, uh, thank you for the super chat. Origen mixed up Hegesippus with Josephus and Contra Kelsum. Did he, his staff, update the James passage in Antiquities, Book 20, because <laughs> of that exact mistake? I, I mean, yes, it's possible. Um, I suspect that he didn't do it, right? Um, I would, um, unless he did it later, right? So like, like if he had done it, he could have just fixed, like he wouldn't have made the mistake, right? So like if he, if he had found that passage and said, oh, this is the passage I meant, then he wouldn't have written the Hegesippus stuff and attributed it to Josephus. So that means that when he wrote Contra Kelsum, he had not realized that he's screwing up who he's talking about, right? So he does not know that he's, quoting and paraphrasing Hegesippus, he's mistaken that for Josephus. Now, it's possible later in life, he's like, you know, someone comments like, hey, I looked in Josephus, I didn't find this thing. And then he's like pouring through and then tried to find it. Uh, and and then he may have put a, a scholarly note, like, is this the one called Christ? You know, so he just, the one called Christ. He might have put it, so that might have been in his manuscript. Or, like you said, it could have been staff or someone after him, because this is the same library, by the way. The same books that Origen has get inherited by Pamphilus, who was the tutor of Eusebius. So Eusebius is sitting in the same library using the exact same books or copies made from those books if they aged out that Origen was using. So by the, so Eusebius is the first time where he seems to know that the Josephus passage has some sort of, is supposed to be connected to the Hegesippus stuff and he sort of fudges it. Uh, but Origen doesn't quote the Josephus passage, only Eusebius does. So whatever happened, happened in between Origen and Eusebius. Uh, and now it could have been some people, you know, Olson claims that it's Eusebius did this. Um, but I think it's entirely possible Pamphilus did it. It's entirely possible it was a scribe in that library that, that you know, unbeknownst to Pamphilus or anyone. It could have been a scholarly note by Origen that was made late, late in his life that got interpolated later. Like there's a lot of 
a lot of different possibilities. We can't nail it down because all we see is this window of about 50 years in between when Origen wrote Contra Kelsum and when Eusebius writes, uh, more than 50 years actually, uh, and when Eusebius writes uh, the first occasion where this passage in Josephus is attributed to our Jesus. Thank you so much for that, Chris. Appreciate the question. Interesting question. Doc Pleromana, good to see you here. Mark and Variants have opposing... He always has these like hardcore <laughs> questions too. You got to love the guy. All right. Mark and Variants have opposing... Is it schizoid? Temp temperaments. Temperaments. Schizoid temperaments, I'm okay. assuming. I can't... The, my screen is too small, so I can't read the text. So I'm totally dependent on I think, you're, on you I think you're on the money there. Schizoid temper, temperaments of Jesus towards the man cured of leprosy. Could Matthew originally have the angry version so omitted all emotion to promote stoicism? Yeah, this is a passage that Bart Ehrman writes a lot about, um, where this there's a lot of dispute in the manuscripts as to what emotion uh, uh, Jesus is expressing in this scene. I haven't really looked into this enough to really comment expertly. I, I, I do recall uh, reading Ehrman's take on this and concluding that he's got a solid take on it. So I, I would I would look at er Bart Ehrman on this. Um, there was also there was some there's another student who's working on uh, stoicism in Matthew. Uh, and Is it a, a lady? Yeah, I'm What's interviewing her, her soon. I cannot remember her name because. It's actually the friend of Robin Faith Walsh that you. That's watched. right. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Because I just watched your, your Walsh interview, which is great. That was fantastic. Um, yeah. That, that. Yeah. Her her colleague who's doing work in this uh, also has something useful to say that, that I had not heard before, where she's analyzing the emotional language and how it tracks Stoic philosophy of, of uh, anger and emotion. Which is interesting because my dissertation advisor at Columbia is actually one of the leading authors on. Uh, uh, vocabulary for emotion, philosophy of emotion in, in antiquity. He wrote a book called, I think it's called Rage. Um, and it's about philosophical control of anger and in the ancient world. So he has whole sections on the Stoic uh, description and philosophy of, of rage and anger, um, which I'm sure she cites. I, I can't imagine she's doing work in this and not citing that book somewhere. Um, so, so there's a lot of interesting stuff being done. I'm not doing it though. So I'm, this isn't an area that I've gone into in much detail. I'm aware of it though. So I, I would recommend read Bart, Bart Ehrman's take on this, the question of what language was originally here, who, who's trying to scrub emotion or add emotion or whatever. Um, I think Ehrman's got the best uh, arguments for that. Thank you, Doc. Good to see you here. Always testing my uh, pronunciation and reading abilities. <laughs> you gotta love them. All right. Grace has a question and he doesn't mean offense to it. So we're going to, we're going to ask it. Thank you for throwing the five at us. How often do you sit down and consider whether or not you're a crank? I don't mean this as an insult. <laughs> <laughs> Just see no, what you do question, to keep actually. yourself honest. Yeah. Uh, no, absolutely. Uh, this is something that I've been taking seriously as a question actually for a really long time. Um, I've been especially interested in it in the last 10 years. Um, so I have to go way back in my history to answer this question. Um, when I, so I was a devout Taoist in high school, had religious experiences that convinced me of this. I talk about it in my book, Sense and Goodness Without God. Um, and then I, for various reasons, logical reasons, philosophical reasons, and scientific reasons, realized it was a false religion when I was in the Coast Guard. And then that led me to like, well, if that's false, what is true? And that led me to the quest that led to the book, Sense and Goodness Without God, which is how do we determine what's true? But in that process, I mean, that was like a 10 year process from when I was in the Coast Guard, started the book literally at sea. Uh, and when I published in 2005, that's like 15 years difference. Uh, the book went through a lot of changes over time. And uh, after I dropped uh, Taoism, I got seduced by Marxism for a while. I was a hardcore Marxist. Then I got seduced by Ayn Rand uh, philosophy. So I was a hardcore Randroid for a while. Uh, and then, um, and realized everybody with all of, they're all wrong. Uh, and then got more into like serious philosophy. And by that point I'd gotten there, I realized like, it is so fucking easy to be wrong. Right. So, cause I had been on the opposite side of so many issues and I'd, I'd changed beliefs so, so much that I, I look back and I go, look how easy it is to be wrong. And so at that point, I, that's the moment in my life when I realized like, I need a better method for checking for this. Like, how do I constantly monitor myself? to make sure I'm not being seduced by another ideology that isn't true. 
and so from that point on, I took methodology very seriously and self-checking is a very, as a fundamental, like you say, the self-examined life is not worth living is the Socratic doctrine. I take that as literally like you need to keep checking yourself, critically checking yourself. Uh, and that's the only way you can make progress in knowledge is to sort of figure out what, what beliefs do I have that are false and how would I know it? Um, and so I, I've been doing it even since then. But in the last 10 years, I've really been taking this seriously. Is like, how, what, what is the actual hardcore methodology of this? Um, that's when I became a Bayesian. So I was very anti-Bayesian until I had a eureka moment and realized I was totally wrong. Uh, and Bayes theorem was very key to part of how you solve these problems. And then getting very much into critical thinking. And people who've been following my blog for the last like five years, uh, certainly the last two, I've really been focusing not just on debunking people I think who are wrong, but analyzing how they got it wrong, right? So that's saying like, like looking like what mistakes of reason, what methodologies are they relying on that's leading to this error rather than just showing that it's wrong, figuring out what, what are they, where are they going wrong basically? And then developing general principles that I can then use to self-check, right? To say like, well, if this is how they're going wrong, I need to self, like run a whole diagnostic on what I'm doing to make sure I'm not doing the same thing. And so I've been very much into this. And so like, that's, that's the big question is like, how do you know uh, you're not a crank? I think that's a question everybody needs to ask of themselves. Uh, for, I, I do take it as a serious question. I think it's probably the most important function of philosophy when you're doing real philosophy, when you're actually living philosophy as a philosopher is exactly that is your, how do you self check uh, to make sure that you're not being seduced or misled or misleading yourself or delusional or all of this stuff. How do you find out? Well, how do you know you're wrong? Uh, and I think that's where I, I've focused a lot on the key to knowing you're right is knowing how to actually disprove what you're saying honestly and then failing, right? So you have, you have to try really hard to prove yourself wrong and not game the proof so that you, you win easily. You have to say, no, I'm going to give you a serious test, a serious fucking test of... Um, of what I believe, really do throw everything at it to prove it wrong. And only if I do that and I fail, do I have any justification for being confident that I'm right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I've built out a lot of tools for how to do this. I've done like my blog has advice on probabilistic reasoning is a good blog to start for this kind of thing. Uh, I've done a lot of this kind of stuff lately. I've been very interested in it. So I, I highly encourage people to focus on that as building out your critical thinking skills is the first task is how do you be self-critical without being, um, you know, without developing imposter syndrome or, or losing confidence or anything like that. Like you have to be able to, a healthy self-criticism rather than an excessive self-criticism, right? Uh, and so you, you really, we really need that. Uh, and then of course you need to be, how do you inoculate yourself against people trying to seduce you uh, with, with bogus ideologies and things like that. So you, you need to be immune to misinformation and disinformation. So, so those are the two things, the outward looking and the inward looking that they both have to work together. They're the only, that's the only way you can make yourself uh, not completely immune, but certainly more immune than you would be uh, to false beliefs. Thank you so much. Gray is good question. And uh, I appreciate it. I'm gonna get the next one and turn this air off here. Uh, Michael, Christian Michael, thank you for the super chat. Given 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8 through 9, formation of christ in believers for glory uh is it 130 i'm having a hard time reading all of this here 130 equals in christ two three equals humble four and five to not by human wisdom six and eight rulers and wisdom and no gnosko of seven equals 16 equals mindset of christ what creature in six and eight 1 Corinthians 1, 20 through 21, 4, 8 through 16, Romans 8, 15 through 19, Philippians 3. <laughs> All right, I'll be back in a year. In, uh, yeah, I, that, that's, I don't know. I, I mean, almost, for a moment there, it sounded like he was describing some sort of role-playing game where we're going to like roll a die and determine um, what the nature of Jesus is. <laughs> help, help me out here, Christian, Christian. If you can elaborate what you're trying to get at here, Let's I'm going to. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I can't follow that, so I don't know what we're going. What was going on there? <clears throat> I had a hard time with that one myself. Let me turn this air off. Hold on one second. Oh yeah, it's possible. Wait, there's not knowing the question or not being able to get yeah. the question. So 
it's possible there's sound coming from out my window right now. I have a truck that's idling, but they'll probably be gone soon, but it looks like they're getting ready to go. But um, just to make sure I, that's not interfering with your audio. I can't tell. Maybe the audience can. I don't know. I can hear like very little sound, but I think it's just the mic, your, your earbuds or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll keep an eye out. Christian Michael says versus. Uh, I don't know. There's a lot of verses there. Yeah, it's too much stuff to analyze quickly. First Corinthians uh, two seven and seven and nine through ten formation of Christ and believers for glory. I mean, it really is like an like a algebraic. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's why I don't I don't understand what the question is. I don't know what's being asked. I I know all those verses. So, but I, I don't know what the connection is or what's being asked about them. So, so if you can write it out, I'll try and keep an eye out for you, Christian, for, for the super chat, write out what you're trying to ask of him and simple in a simple form. And I'll be sure. Yeah. To do make, it. make it shorter and direct what the question is. Uh, focus on what is the question? What creature in six and eight? So I'm interested in knowing, like, try and write that out, please. Thank you for the support. Indo, you're back. Where'd baptism come from? Did it come from mystery religions or Merkve from Jews? Did Zalmoxis, Osiris, Dionysus, or Romulus have baptism Christian rituals? Yeah, baptism was a mystery religion thing. Um, definitely an Osiris cult. We have a very elaborate dis discussion of baptism and what it meant uh, in Osiris cult in the Golden Ass by Apuleius. Um, we have other examples of libation ceremonies. It goes all the way back to Plato. Plato refers to um, um, water ceremonies that have something to do with the initiation and in, in, in mystery cult at the time. So, so we have a long tradition of baptism as a thing. Um, now, we don't know. So it's less clear how it moved into Judaism. So, for example, uh, uh, John the Baptist, according to the Gospels, Actually, we can question whether Josephus was, how much Josephus was talking about this, because um, we're not sure how much there might have been meddling in the passage about this. I think it's mostly authentic. Um, and so I think Josephus does attest to this as well, which is that there was some sort of baptism ritual that uh, John the Baptist was engaging in. And the Gospels definitely make it this way, too. They, they very much want to associate their baptism as the successor and culmination of John the Baptist's baptism. <clears throat> Hence, he's called John the Baptist for that reason. Um, so so it, th if that's the case, then that means that the concept of baptism had already moved into Judaism before Christianity arose, which is entirely plausible because we have lots of examples of ideas from the Greeks that have already moved into Judaism before Christianity comes around. And when Christianity builds itself, it's already working from these Hellenized ideas within uh, Judaism. Uh, so, so that I think that's probably the most likely path. Uh, and we have exam we have references to secret teachings and mystery cult like stuff at Qumran, but I don't think we have an ex explicit discussion of baptism there. There's discussion of the the Merkava, the um, uh, the the libation pools, the the special ritual cleaning pools, possibly at Qumran. I, I think that's conjectural we don't really know what what the things we found there are actually used for but uh it's entirely possible that there is something like this going on but the key thing for baptism is what makes it a baptism and not just any water ritual is that there's somehow undergoing it secures your salvation it's somehow important uh and even more specifically in, in osiris cult it is a symbolic death and resurrection like literally you are born again that's that's actually in the Latin of Apuleius that you are born again when you have the baptism as to a mm. new life. You, you go through this, you go, you share the death and resurrection of Osiris symbolically through the baptism ritual. And thus you come out the other side assured of eternal life, uh, the same as, as Osiris. So that's exactly what's going on in Christianity. Their baptism is exactly that. That's, and M Paul is very explicit about this. Like Romans eight, for example, Romans seven and eight, where he goes into this idea of baptism. Uh, Galatians has several sections where he goes into baptism as not only a symbolic death and resurrection, but as a symbolic um, adoption by God. So that's how you become a son of God through the baptism ritual. So uh, so I, I, I suspect that Christianity is adapting this from an already adapted Jew Jewish version of it. Um, so I think it, it, the mystery cult idea has already moved into Judaism. They're already using it. 
And if we trust the Gospels on this to be accurate about what John the Baptist was doing, John the Baptist was clearly an anti-temple uh, 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 teacher because he was preaching atonement through baptism in the Jordan or wherever he was actually preaching. Which means that it, this is very significant because this means that whoever is going to John the Baptist to get baptized doesn't trust and isn't using the temple cult anymore, which was very offensive to the Jewish elite who were very much oriented on following Levitical temple law, right? That the only way you could get atonement for your sins was through the temple rituals. John the Baptist was, if we believe the gospels, teaching the opposite, that you don't need the temple. You can go through this baptism and this will give you atonement. So it sounds very similar to what the Christians eventually uh, built that into. And all they did was plug Jesus in and say like, well, okay, so our baptism is symbolically the death and resurrection of Jesus. You now share in this, just like an Osiris cult, be super familiar to people of the time. Um, but they've Judaized it. They made it an acceptably Jewish version of this, uh, using the idea of the Messiah, using the idea of the, the Pesher logic and, and so on. So um, it's Judaized. Uh, so it's very, it's an acceptably Jewish version of this idea, but it definitely, I think, comes from mystery cult, if not directly, then through uh, the Baptist cult uh, that preceded Christianity. Wow. Great question, Endo. And that, <laughs> there's so much there to get into. Thank you so much. Chris, thank you for the super chat. Did Pamphilus Eusebius add the testimony in Flavianum? because of Origen's failure to find anything regarding Christ in Josephus' antiquities, or because of demonstratio or demonstratio ev? The, ev? So the, they're referring to the Demonstratio Evangelicum, which is another book. So most people know Eusebius' uh, church history, the, the Historia Ecclesia, but um, most people know that. But he wrote a bunch of other books that are actually harder to find. English translations of they, they exist they're, they're online now pretty easy to find but uh but he did the Preparatio Evangelica and the Demonstratio Evangelica these are two separate books and in all three of these the church history the demonstration of the gospel and the preparation for the gospel every single one of those he quotes the testimonium Flavianum as from Josephus um which is how we know that version of it the form that we have is the form that Eusebius was looking at because he he repeats it in all three books which means all manuscripts of all those books all agree. There's no way that's possible unless this is what Joseph, this is what Eusebius was seeing in the text or wanted people to see in the text of Josephus. Um, so the question is, who put it there? Uh, and you know, Ken Olson makes an argument that the vocabulary of the TF is very Eusebian. In fact, it's m m substantially more Eusebian than Josephian, and that is true. Um, the linguistic analysis is spot on. Definitely sounds like Eusebius and not like Josephus. Uh, and, and it conveniently helps Eusebius in all the arguments he wants to make in three different books. And he uses it all over the place. So he is suspect number one, right? Um, I think it's possible that his predecessor, Pamphilus, did it. And that Eusebius doesn't know that he did this. That Eusebius genuinely thinks that this passage was written by Josephus and he finds it just spectacularly useful and uses it everywhere. And that would that could explain the, the Eusebian vocabulary. If Eusebius' style and vocabulary is heavily influenced by his tutor, Pamphilus, right? So he was his teacher. So it is plausible that they would have similar styles. Uh, and so it could have been written by Pamphilus and inserted there. And it's possible he did that without Eusebius knowing. However, Eusebius is a big fat liar. Uh, we've extensively documented him being a liar. So I, I don't think we can rule out Eusebius just lying and, and doing it, being the one who did this and putting it in there and then claiming it was there all along. That would fit Eusebius' pattern of behavior. So we can't rule Eusebius out either. <laughs> but it could be either one. I think either one fits the evidence we have. Yeah, I enjoyed Ken Olson's article where he opens up with a statement of Josephus, not, not Josephus, sorry, Eusebius, who's quoting one of the pagan kings that's fighting against uh, Constantine as if he heard and like listened to this entire diatribe of like, well, whoever's God wins in this battle. And it's like this like pro-Christian thing invented by Eusebius to make Christianity look good in that battle. But I just thought it was really interesting. I pointed that out. So yeah, we definitely got to take him with a grain of salt. Gray's 174. Thoughts on Dr. James White. Would you debate him? Um, I can't think of any reason I wouldn't. Um, 
the only people I don't debate are liars and lunatics. Um, so, uh, and there are certain people on my list, uh, David Wood and uh, Atwill. Um, Atwill's both a liar and a lunatic. So, <laughs> uh, so there are people I won't debate uh, for that reason. Uh, I'm not where, like, I don't know to what extent White uh, is a dishonest person. I haven't really, like, analyzed his rhetoric to see. Um, I would debate William Lane Craig again only because uh, he's hasn't changed up anything. Like he he's easy to beat now because he just uses the same arguments over and over again. Um, so even though wow. Craig William Lane Craig is a notorious liar, like probably the biggest liar in in Christianity today. Like it's I mean I have a huge list of this examples, just this huge list of linked examples of him lying uh, and. Uh, my article on extraordinary evidence. So I did an article on Craig's lies about the, the extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence uh, argument. Uh, and then in the opening paragraph of that, I list like 20 other examples of it, it, where we've just got him dead to rights where he's just lying all over the place. Um, Habermas also is a bit of a liar. Uh, I've documented that. You can find that on my website too. Um, I, I think I would be willing to debate those guys. Um, the uh simply because I think I jacked things up here. I messed us up. That's what I get for sharing the screen. Ah okay. Back out, come back in. Yeah. I don't know, man. I don't know. I can't help it. <laughs> so I shouldn't have done that. I should not have shared the screen. I like to plug my, my guest. I'm a shameless plug because I really want to help uh, people who come on my channel that I entertain. So forgive me for that. Uh, look, go to his website. If you haven't done that, you could support what he does there as well. There's ways to donate. There's ways to take classes, courses. He's got articles, you name it, this little search box right here. Oh, hold on. I'm not even, it's not even up. There's a little search box right up here. Search this blog. You can find whatever you're looking for on the blog. Uh, he has lots of books. Let me get it out of the way. And of course the Patreon to help me out. All right. He's coming back any second now. Forgive me, everybody, please forgive me. This is a uh, part of the hiccup. But I, I was enjoying this, what he's saying about Habermas and, and uh, going into William Lane Craig. You there? Right. Did that work? Did that work? I am done sharing the screen. <laughs> so, yeah, I, don't, I just I don't know how, why I, that happened. I just did a plug for you and let everybody know. Go down in the description. Anyway, about the debaters, like people you were debating. Yeah, so why? Yeah, I, to I would totally debate why. I don't see any reason not to. Um, but I, I don't organize debates. So someone else would have to do it. And I, and I have a page on what my requirements are. You go to my booking page, which is right at, it's linked at the top of my website. Um, and it, down in the booking page, there's a debate. Uh, so all the booking page stuff applies, but then there's also a, a link for debate specifically, although my requirements are pretty simple. Um, I only do generally paid debates. Uh, you gotta pay me to do it because it's, it's, I find them super annoying. And so, uh, they're a labor. Uh, so, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't do them for free. Uh, I prefer, no. um, written debates actually. So and I've done several of those really effectively on my blog, uh, where we do short statements and lots of them back and forth, uh, and written debates allow everybody to carefully parse rhetoric, to fact check, to reference, find their references and so on. So it's, it's, uh, forces people to be honest. And it also gives them the opportunity to not screw up from, you know, because if you're like in in the time you, you're very if you're limited time, like you you can misspeak, forget something. Like there's lots of like reasons that have nothing to do with the solidity of your case. Mm -hmm. um, that that and there's lots of ways to emotionally manipulate and stuff like that. So oral debates I find are more they're more entertainment than than productive. Uh, whereas uh, I find written debates can be really spot on and really zero in on what is it that we're disputing and what why do we believe what we believe and so on. So I do prefer written debates, but I'll do oral debates um, if someone funds them and or arranges them. Thank you so much, Grays. 
Doc Pleuromonade, who are the anti-Pauline servants of Satan? If a new group of recommended spirit-filled leaders are arriving in Corinth, it's sleazy Paul then appealed to one suffering for legitimacy. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. That's too, that's too vague a question. Uh, it sounds like they're asking, like, who were the opponents of Paul that was uh, basically gumming his game in Corinth, which is, um, I'm not sure that there is a single answer to that. I think that Paul has, is operating against, there's a whole bunch of these missionaries. So there's Apollos, for example. It's clear that Apollos is going around preaching things slightly different than Paul. And Paul's getting these questions like, hey, Apollos said this thing. It contradicts what you said. So how, what, right? And so, um, same thing with Peter. So Peter is preaching different things, and so they're hearing different stuff. And so Paul has to answer back and sort of smooth these things over. Um, and sometimes we get explicit representations of what these arguments are. Sometimes Paul is vague about what these arguments are, uh, and he uses the this, the diplomatic. Well, we're, we're, they're all true in their own way. Uh, no one has to declare themselves for Apollos or Kephos or me. We're all teaching right. the same gospel, right? You know, it's that kind of, uh, it's like basically harmonize it, work it out. That is, is his, his thing, which is his non-response essentially uh, to, the, to the conflicting information. We have other examples where this information has been removed. So I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a transition in 1 Corinthians 8 to 1 Corinthians 9. Uh, these appear to come from different letters that someone has smashed together. And they've left out everything that was the beginning part of Corinthians 9, 1 Corinthians 9. And, but they pushed them together because they're both about food vaguely. So like the, these are like Paul's teachings on food, and they sort of just mash them together. But they're, they're addressing completely different arguments. So in, in, in chapter 8, he's addressing a completely different argument. And then suddenly in, in chapter 9, as soon as you go right to the end of 8, right to 9-1, it's a completely different argument. You're right in the middle of the argument. We've missed, we don't even know what the argument is. And he's like answering, it's clear that he explained what the argument was and is now answering it, but we don't have that. Someone took and it out. Do, doesn't this so, help with like drawing conclusions that these are not epistolary fiction? I mean, these seem like real letters yes. in a way. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a point I have made, um, you know, for, for others, some who've argued, you know, Dietering and stuff uh, and, yeah. and other the Dutch radicals and so on have argued that the Pauline epistle, one of the arguments they have is that the Pauline epistles are too long to be representative of authentic letters. If we look at actual authentic letter collections like Pliny, um, Cicero, um, we, have a, we have a variety of these, um, letters tend to be shorter, uh, and much shorter than the letters we have. Um, now that, that argument is, uh, not, not useless. Uh, it has merit. It's a little weak in the sense that we don't have direct analogs and an example, uh, or we don't have direct analogs outside of Christianity, which is a problem. We don't have the epistolary correspondence of any other religion. Like mm -hmm. we have nothing. So we don't know if these long form epistolary structures are typical of interchurch um, communications in other religions. We, we don't, we can't say that's not the case because we don't have any examples to, to go from. And, and an example of what I mean is uh, one Clement. One Clement is clearly a single coherent homily. It's explicitly, as it even says, it's intended to be read out loud to the Corinthians. And so um, this actually puts it more in the genre of speech writing. And we have lots of examples of speeches from the ancient world, particularly in the what's called the second sophistic, which is the era in which Christianity arose. Long form speeches are a thing, definitely mm -hmm. a thing. So, um, so, so first Corinthians, or I'm sorry, first Clement is very definitely the intention is here's a long speech. I'm sending it. I'm in Rome. I can't be out there to read it myself. I'm sending it, read it for me. Right. So it's basically, it's more of a speech than a letter. And it's a letter only in the trivial sense that it had to be sent from Rome to Corinth. Uh, and that actually makes total sense why it would be long form. And so in that context, that does not indicate that it's a forgery. That indicates that it's an authentic communication method, that this is a, a thing that Clement really wanted to do. You, I need you to read this speech because I can't be there and they're, I'm just mailing it, right? Uh, and so it's a, entire, and Paul references this too. Like he's talking about like people need to read his letters out to the congregation. So Paul could be writing long form homilies as well. These are actually speeches not letters per se. Um, they're just letters in the sense that they get mailed, 
uh, right? So, you know, sent by messenger or whatever. Um, so that's possible too. However, it's also very notable that many scholars have pointed out, and I, I have footnotes to the books and articles about this in on the historicity of Jesus. Or there's a section where I talk about this, that uh, all the letters we have are pastiches of other letters. So Philippians is multiple letters smashed together. Romans, multiple letters smashed together. First Corinthians, this is an example where I think someone smashed together right. pieces. So the reason they're long is they originally were short. Uh, and then someone just took pieces of these letters and built them out into long letters. And it's possible these were letters all sent to Corinth, right? Could have been a bunch of letters sent to Corinth. Uh, and that got mashed together. And now we're calling it First Corinthians. And we're only calling it that because it fits one scroll. And then the, the, we're calling the other one Second Corinthians because we couldn't fit those pieces into the one scroll. So now we have two scrolls. So we need scroll one and scroll two. And that's why we have First Corinthians and Second Corinthians, right? Um, that appears to have happened as well. The, the evidence seems pretty clear that that's what these letters are. They're pastiches of letters. And this tells us two things. One is you can't use the long form argument against them being epistles, even though that's a bad argument anyway. Um, but also it means that these are probably authentic epistles because you don't do this with forgeries. Right. If you're if you're forging a letter, you're going to forge the whole letter. You're not going to, you know, forge a bunch of little letters and then break them up and bash them together. Right. This, like that. That's not that actually disproves the forgery hypothesis. Right. These are clearly authentic letters that someone is taking and and stitching and pasting to create their own version of stuff um, without rewriting them. So that means that that actually is an argument for authenticity uh, of these letters. Thank you for grabbing my question. I. I appreciate it. Chris, is there an extra biblical evidence that cor corroborates the book of Acts? Like, was Paul really in Athens, Acts 17, or is mm. it a complete fabrication? Well, uh, it's clear that the author of Acts has all the letters of Paul, some form of the letters of Paul, uh, because he deliberately contradicts Paul all the time, um, like like conspicuously in, al in alignment with the author's uh, intentions. So, for instance, it's important to the author to erase the Arabian ministry of Paul. Uh, he, he needs a certain sequence of events to tell the narrative that he wants to tell. Uh, he needs Peter to be the one to get the Gentile church idea, even though that in Paul, that's absolutely the exact opposite of what happened, right? Um, so Acts has these propagandistic motives that he has, and he needs to rewrite the story uh, that the eyewitness Paul has of his own life. So there's a lot of stuff in Acts that directly contradicts Paul entirely and, and intentionally contradicts Paul. But Act, the author of Acts is writing revisionist history. The actual history is a problem for him, so he needs to rewrite it uh, uh, to, to make it the version of history that he wants to have happened, right? To sell the particular mission that he has. So there is a lot being made up in Acts. A lot of it is literary. A lot of it's bogus. Um, but there's also real stuff in there, right? So, uh, and, and there's real stuff that we can confirm. So we know like, for instance, we know that there was uh, there were councils meetings between Paul and the Jerusalem church. Now, Acts completely gets the chronology wrong and, and, and changes everything up and so on. So it's not really an accurate representation of these. But he's at least getting the idea that these these councils happened from Paul. And so so there, there's some there's some overlap here. The idea that Paul goes to Damascus, that's in Paul. Right. So Acts gets the idea that he goes to Damascus in there. Now he screws up the chronology and everything. But uh, but he at least gets the idea from Paul. Right. And it's possible that Acts has other information that we don't have access to, that it is authentic. So to give you an example of what I mean, uh, in, um, uh, in Acts, Paul has the vision of Jesus that is bizarrely unlike any of the other encounters. That, that This is the same author who wrote the ending of Luke. Why wouldn't he have Jesus come down and actually talk to, G talk to Paul as a person and have him handle him and eat fish with him and all of that stuff? Like, why is he a bodiless voice in the sky, right? Like, why is he just this ambiguous light? Like, that's, that's weird, right? Like, so where, where, does, where does the author of Acts get this idea? Now, this actually tracks Revelation, because Paul talks about, I have these revelations and stuff, and Jesus speaks to him in Revelation and, and inside himself. He actually refer, references it as Jesus. He meets Jesus inside himself. He's not a person that he walks around with. So it's possible that this light and voice vision Acts is getting from somewhere, it's from an authentic tradition from Paul, like Paul might have talked about how he met Jesus. And this might have been similar to how everyone met Jesus, right? So for all we know, but Acts is using it, and he might be distorting it. Um, he's using it 
as a model to build out his story of Paul. So there could be authentic information there, but we don't know because we don't have whatever source he's using right. for that information. And to give you an example of what I mean by distortion, Paul talks about glossolalia, speaking in tongues, uh, as a phenomenon in the, in the church. And he, he talks about it enough that we can tell that the phenomenon he's talking about is exactly the same as worldwide global religion. We, we actually have science of glossolalia. We've, we've got scientific studies. It's, been, it's a phenomenon uh, all over the world in all, all sorts of religions, not just Christianity. But glossolalia is random symbols, random syllables. And then you need a, uh, an interpreter who, who can interpret this foreign alien angelic language or whatever, right? Uh, and Paul talks about this is what's going on in his churches. People are like babbling randomly and you need interpreters to like explain. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's important to note that this is actually how a lot of Greek oracles worked too. The um, Oracle of Delphi does this. Uh, she just, she gets high on the gases coming out of the rock and then babbles randomly. And then the prophetes, the prophets sit there and interpret and, and, and they explain, like, they, they somehow you know, magically know what she's saying. Um, uh, they're making it up, I'm sure. But, uh, but anyway, so this is a phenomenon in the ancient world. The book of Acts, however, notice it now suddenly glossolalia means actually magically knowing all these foreign languages, right? Like it's some sort of the ability to speak all the languages of the world that you've never been taught before and everybody understands you and stuff like it. Isn't this magical? Isn't this miraculous? It's obvious that that is not what was going on in the churches. Acts is making this up. This is bogus. Mm -hmm. But it's taking a core story of what is true. The glossolalia was a phenomenon in the church. Notice it never comes up again in the history of Acts, right? So like, like it's, they have one scene. Uh, it's completely distorted. It's not an accurate representation of what was going on. And then the church never has speaking in tongues again. Like it never comes up again. This is very much shows how Acts writes. Like he's, he wants to tell stories to make certain points. He doesn't care a whole lot about whether the stories are true. He gets ideas from truth uh, and then spins out wild fantasies and lies. Right. So, uh, so the book of Acts is deeply unreliable. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's completely made up. There's stuff in there that is, is getting kernels of stuff, some, some of which we can confirm uh, in outside evidence, uh, but a lot of which we can't. We don't know what things Axe is making up, which kernels are true. Um, there might be more kernels of truth in there than we can verify, and I think that's highly likely. Thanks for that super chat, Chris. Gray is 174. Have you heard about the take where fig tree story is an enacted parable, meaning Jesus really did curse it, to make the temple season over point, then the story would make sense <laughs> taken literally. <laughs> yeah. Except people can't curse fig trees. So you can't, you can't wither a fig tree there. They're, they're X-Men aren't a thing. Harry Potter is not true. <laughs> There's no ability to wither a fig tree. Um, so, so I doubt, I doubt that, right. I, I doubt there was a true story in which Jesus cursed a fig tree and a day later it withered to its very roots. Um, nor do I imagine like the, uh, you know, the, the apostles are digging up the roots to confirm that it's withered all the way to the roots either. Like, like it's obvious fiction. Like there, there's no reason to come up with a rationalization. This, this tendency to, to rationalize miracles, to make them into historical events that follow some sort of rational science was a big trend in the 19th century. A lot of the gospels are being reinterpreted this way and the old Testament too. Like, Oh, Moses didn't part the, the, the Red Sea. It was actually like, it was just wind and it was actually a shallow part of the, the Sea of Reeds, right? And then it was just, there was a wind and then, and then and people just misinterpreted it, you know, like these ridiculous, uh, no, no, it's a made up story. Just, it's much more likely to be just a completely made up story. There's, there's no need to try and come up with some ad hoc rationalization for it. And there's no evidence for that either, right? Like this, there's, Paul never talks about the, do you remember the fig tree that Jesus withered? That that tree's still there. I visited it myself. You know, that that's not in Paul. There's nothing like that, and and it only shows up in Mark and an in an author who's obviously making stories up to make symbolic points. Right. Um, so so I, there's no reason to believe that there was ever a real incident. Thank you so much, Gray's hilarious question. Chris <laughs> is back. Did Josephus release the twenty books of antiquities of the Jews all at once? around 92 mm -hmm. CE, or was it a staggered release over a couple of years? We don't know. Uh, both are possible. Uh, it was common back then for authors to read sections of their book before publishing, like publicly. Um, so, uh, and yeah, so, so it's unknown. Um, we know that the last book 
I think it's the last book. And he might not have written them in, in that order either. Like he might have written the last book first for all we know, right? So it, it depends on, on what his design was. Um, the last book is the one that references information that dates the book to after 93. Um, so he, he has information in there that means that he's had to have been writing after 90 or 93 or later. Um, so, so that's how we date the book. But all dates like this are, are vague. Like, so we, we don't know, like, yeah, was he doing a volume a year starting in 93? Did he start a volume a year? Like, or, or you know, oh, it couldn't have been a volume a year. It had to be multiple volumes a year if right. he's doing it. Um, did he start before 93? I, you know, I, we, we don't really know. Um, all we can say for certain is that we have no evidence that anything in the antiquities was written before 93. Um, right. So, so anything beyond that is speculation and speculation is idle. We, we can't build conclusions off of speculations because there's speculation in speculation out you get nowhere. So, um, so that, that's all we can say for sure is that, that, uh, that it's, there's no evidence that it was published before anything of it was published before 93. Thank you so much. Dharma defender. Good to see you here. And thank you for the support. Dr. Carrier question about your blog post on morality, that there's no fact value distinction. How does a fact necessitate that I ought to value it? Yeah, that sounds like someone who's not read my blog articles on this uh, because I answer this question. Um, I've answered it under peer review too. I actually have a peer reviewed uh, article on moral theory that goes into this, but I have several articles on my blog about um, how, how do uh, imperatives reduce to um, indicatives. Uh, and this is not controversial. In fact, uh, people often misquote Hume as saying you can't do this. Hume said the opposite. He said that you have to do this and it's the Christians who aren't doing it. And that's why we can dismiss their morality. And then Hume immediately goes on to reduce an ought to an is through his own scientific attempt. Um, so Hume actually is the first person, not the first person, but he's the first modern uh, philosopher to, to argue this. Um, reducing imperatives to indicatives goes all the way back probably before Aristotle, but Aristotle's clearly doing it. Um, so it, it was just an assumed case that you can, you can reduce. In fact, you had to. Philosopher, ancient philosophers felt that you couldn't justify any morality if you can't reduce it to some sort of indicative facts about uh, human nature in the world and so on. Um, so all, all ancient philosophies reduce an ought to an is in different ways. Um, you know, Epicureanism does it through social contract theory. Aristotelianism does it through um, uh, virtues, virtue ethics, which is more like... Um, Social dynamic theory, uh, essentially, like you have to behave a certain way in order to live a, live life uh, in, a, in a way that you would want to. Um, and, and Stoics, they, they got a little supernatural with it. So they, they have a little bit of like mind of God stuff. Um, but <clears throat> uh, the creationism is big in, in Stoicism, uh, which tracks a lot closer to what Christians later started teaching about um, the grounding of morality. Now, what about uh, Taoism? Because I know, I think he... Yeah, no, totally. Taoism is grounds it in the nature of the Tao, right? So, so because the Tao governs everything and behaves a certain way, you're just kicking at the goad unless you adhere to the Taoist ethics, right? So it's like, um, you're just going to make your life more miserable uh, unless if you want to like live in harmony and live like a satisfying, uh, happy life, then you have to live a certain way. And that's just a fact. Like it's, it's just a fact. Like you, you can't, you can't magically behave any other way and get a different result. Um, now to give you an example of what we're talking about here, um, it's long been known, even since Kant, even Kant admits that imperatives reduce to, oughts reduce to is. Like he, he's, he says this, like he goes into the detail of hypothetical imperatives. Most imperatives, which are propositions about instructing you that you ought to do something, most imperatives are uh, reduced to is. Uh, and it's like, so for example, if you, if you want your uh, car to drive, you ought to put gas in it. Um, so here's two things. Like you, if, if you have that desire, and, and the physics of how cars work, put those two is's together and the ought becomes true, uh, right? So like you, you, can't, you can't wave a wand at your car with an empty gas tank and it. it's not gonna go, right? So, um, so, if, so you have to have the desire uh, for the outcome and then it's physics as to what you have to actually do to achieve that desire. So all oughts reduced to an is in that sense, in the hypothetical imperative sense. Now Kant, he recognizes this and he doesn't like it. Um, so he came up with this alternative called a categorical imperative. And he says, well, I'm going to say that morals are different than all other imperatives, that there's some sort of weird, alien, different kind of imperative uh, called a categorical imperative. And he goes in this long discourse about trying to defend the categorical imperative. 
And uh, the problem is, is that he ends up just describing another hypothetical imperative. And I show this under peer review in my chapter on this in uh, The End of Christianity, where that, that all, all Kant does is just end up d defining a different hypothetical imperative. Uh, and then eventually, you know, Philippa Foote, who is one of the greatest women philosophers of the 20th century, she noticed this and she says, you know, actually, um, the categorical imperative is a waste of time because it's just another hypothetical imperative, which means morality is just a system of hypothetical imperatives, which actually reduces all oughts to an is. Um, and so, uh, so I follow very much in the Philippa Foote tradition, uh, but I've shown that you can actually unify all moral theories under her organizing principles. So you can get Aristotelianism, Kantian, and uh, utilitarianism. You can all merge them into a single theory uh, using the same same principles. But if you want to go into like the semantics of this, uh, in, into how the logic works, how do you reduce the ought to an is in logical form, all of that stuff, that's in my work. Um, so you can find colloquial discussions of it on my blog. If you want the peer-reviewed formal version, uh, that's in The End of Christianity, uh, edited book by John Loftus. Thank you so much. Jarrett, thank you for the support. The Gospels introduce us to the idea that Jesus gives Peter the nickname Kephas or Kephas. We know that Paul says he met Kephas. Is the gospel story a post hoc way to connect Jesus to this historical person? Um, so that starts in Mark. Uh, I'm less certain that Mark really wants fellow Christians to believe anything he's writing is historical, right? So I, I think he's doing what Mark 4 says, which is I'm writing stories to communicate ideas about the gospel and the people who take what I'm writing as literally true are the the, the outsiders, like the the losers, basically. Like the, those are the people I'm trying to hide the truth from. Um, so I suspect that Mark is not doing things like that. Like he's not putting that story in there to create a historical Jesus. Um, I, I think he's putting that story in there because I suspect um, possibly he's just creating an etiological myth. This is one of the most common kinds of myth where there's some institution or some name of something, uh, and then you, you, no one knows where it came from, so you invent a story to tell. So you're like, you say, well, why is Weasel Mountain called Weasel Mountain? And like, well, let me tell you a story. And then you make some bullshit up about weasels on the mountain or something, right? But they, they don't, no one really remembers or knows why it's called Weasel Mountain, but you can make up a story. Uh, and so etiological myths are very common. There's a human urge to do this, to make up stories, to explain things that have, people have forgotten the origin of. Uh, so that it could be that, um, it, but I think it could also be that, that this comes from an actual vision of Peter. Uh, so, so, you know, Paul talks about how, um, it's very clear in Galatians one, that you're not an apostle unless Jesus revealed himself to you mystically, which means that's how all the other apostles met Jesus. Right. And, and of course, if you're an atheist, you have to agree with this because Paul says they all met Jesus after he was dead. Well, there's only one way to meet someone after they're dead and that's in a vision, hallucination, et cetera, dream. Um, so that opens up the question of, well, what did the first vision to Kephas, what did it contain? And I think it's entirely plausible that one of the things that he imagined Jesus telling him is that I am, I am now declaring you the rock on which I'm building my, my future, you know, the new Israel. And so you are now the Kephas, which is Aramaic for rock. Peter is the Greek uh, translation of rock. So this may have been a cultic title that Peter assumed upon himself, claiming that Jesus gave it to him in a, in a dream or in a vision, right? So, um, so I think that's entirely plausible too. I think that, and you can look, Paul talks about the pillars. There's Peter, James, and John are the pillars. Now, pillars is an interesting reference. So you've got the rock and you've got the pillars. It sounds like we have a whole cultic vocabulary here for the founders of this church that they've all sort of give, they're starting to give themselves these sort of cultic names. Um, and one thing we can be absolutely certain is Kephas is not a name. So in, uh, there's no such name in Aramaic or Hebrew. So already in Paul, that he's calling this guy Kephas, we already know that this has to be some sort of weird cultic nickname. It's not his actual name. Um, and so that begs the question of, well, why is Kephas going around calling himself Kephas? Like, wh wh why does Paul use that word? It's not his name. So why has, how has it become his name? And the most plausible answer is that Jesus came to him in a dream and says, you are Kephas now. Um, right? So, uh, so I think that's, that's a very plausible explanation too. Is to, and then Mark is just reifying that the way he reifies everything in Paul uh, and, and his other sources, right? So he's just telling a story. In, in this, of course, he has Jesus walking around. So he has Jesus do it while he's walking around. But in historical reality, 
this event would have happened after the resurrection of Jesus. That's when he would have named Peter. Uh, and so, um, and so I think like the, Paul or Mark is just moving around history to to create the story that he wants to tell. But it's just another etiological myth. Um, but in this case, in that model, it comes from Kephas himself. Hmm. Thank you so much. Humbly questioning: Are you a moral realist or anti-realist? Can you share a syllogism for your view? Share a syllogism. Um, no, the if you're going to get to moral syllogisms, or if you're getting to syllogisms that prove moral truths, they're complex and elaborate. And I have them. They're in my appendix to the chapter that I have in um, The End of Christianity uh, that was peer-reviewed by four philosophers, uh, professional philosophers. So if you want the syllogism, you're going to have to go there. It's way, way too much to talk about here. Um, but uh, I'm a moral realist, uh, definitely. And that means that I do think that imperatives, basically morals, Moral imperatives, the only difference they have from any other imperatives is that moral imperatives supersede all other imperatives. In fact, I think that's just a tautology. It's like when you call something a moral imperative, you are just saying these are imperatives that supersede all other imperatives. There's no other imperatives that, are, that you would have to obey over these, right? These are the ones that you obey over all others. And so um, once you've defined it that way, and then you know what, how, how to prove any imperative true, like if you're a surgeon and you want to save the life of a patient and, and you know, you have to sterilize your instruments. You have to sterilize your instruments, right? Uh, you can show that if you have a particular goal and uh, you want to accomplish that goal because you, you, that's your goal, uh, the physics of the world demand and the opera way society works and everything demands it. There's only certain ways that it's going to work, right? There's only one way to achieve it. Uh, maybe several ways, but all of those would then be moral ways to achieve it. And so the only thing that makes something in a moral imperative is that it keys off of something that you want more than anything else in life. And so you have to get to like, what is it that people really want most of all? Uh, and life satisfaction, like to live a satisfying life is actually the one thing that supersedes all other things. And Aristotle started this logic. He says like, whatever your reason is to do something, you can ask of that reason, why do you want that? And then you answer that and you say, well, why do you want that? You have to answer, why do you want that? And then Aristotle tra traces it back. And says, What's the one thing, the only thing that we want for itself? That there's no other reason that we want it. And, it's, and for him, it's eudaimonia, which is, we translate as happiness. I think satisfaction is a better translation. Because eudaimonia means literally good spirit. But it means like um, uh, uh, well-being, uh, but emotional well-being. It's more like, uh, so it's more like satisfaction rather than happiness specifically. Um, and so eudaimonia, this is the Aristotelian argument. So this is like the first time that someone explicitly uh, uh, did moral realism by reducing an ought to an is uh, through, through the eudaimonia argument, which is a psychological argument. And I think Aristotle is partly right. Like there's, uh, there's a lot of science backing this, actually. And I talk about that science in, in my work in various places. Thank you so much. Humbly questioning. Joseph Rotoni, why do you presume Hercules was a mythical person? Is it also as likely a strong man is the kernel of the myth? If so, what about a wise man, Jesus? There's no reason to believe that, right? So this gets back to like rationalizing Moses parting the sea by, oh, it was just wind, right? Like it's, it's you're just making stuff up at this point. Um, there's no reason to believe that there was a historical Hercules. Uh, and so the question, the burden is on someone who would argue that there was one. Um, and the, the biggest problem is that Hercules... Hercules is probably the, not the best example for the general phenomenon. Dionysus would be a better one. Because we have, you go all the way back to Minoan literature, there's already a Dionysus, and he's already a celestial god. He's not like a hero walking around. And it's by the time you get to classical Greece that you get like the, the Trojan War myths, where you have all of these gods are living around the same time, conveniently, uh, and, uh, and all walking the earth around then. And so... The, the placing them in history post-dates the, the original worshiping them as a sky god, basically, some form of celestial. Uh, Hercules, I think there's evidence showing the same thing. So, for instance, the, the Greeks themselves thought that Melkart, who is this ancient Sumerian deity that goes way, way far back, was Hercules, right? So they think that, that that's, he's often in the mystery cult of Hercules Melkart was an actual thing in the Roman Empire where they just, it's Hercules in the role of, milk cart right so um so everybody basically is you have this hercules who's a strong man now every god who's a strong man is hercules right so so you, you know what i mean so 
it's obvious that there's no actual strongman behind any of these stories. The stories are completely mythological. Um, the Hercules 12 labors is an astrological metaphor. You know, there's like, there's no historical basis for any of this. Uh, and, uh, and when they are placed, like when Hercules is put into history, um, there's no logical connection to any actual Hercules that would make sense, right? So it's, it's obvious that people are doing this after the fact. Because there was a big deal in ancient Greece about the Peloponnesus. There was a legend that Hercules had divided the Peloponnesus among his three sons. Uh, and therefore, the historicity of Hercules became a political weapon. Uh, if you were going to argue, if you were someone who wanted like the, the, the you know, the, uh, the um, Spartans who wanted to unify the Peloponnesus, uh, it was very important to claim, oh, well, Hercules is real and the sons, it was originally a one unit and you divided it amongst his sons. So we're just reunifying the Herculean uh, thing. But, but if you look at the, the logic of the history, it, they put his, Hercules in completely the wrong time. So there's no way it could have been in the actual Hercules because we have examples of worshipped Hercules long before that, right? So it can't be, right? So, the, so the, you know, Hercules long predates any of the, the political institutions in, in uh, the Peloponnesus. So, um, so you can see that all the attempts to place Hercules in history are bullshit, right? So they're, they're, not, they're not real. And then all the stories about Hercules are completely ridiculous. And so that, and they're all over the place, right? So they're everywhere. Everybody's got a Hercules shrine, right? Um, so there's no way to trace it back to any one person. Like there, there's no logic there. And when you look at other gods that are parallels, like Dionysus is a good example. Um, Inanna uh, is the predecessor to the Aphrodite cults and so on. You look at those deep histories. So Egypt has, you know, Osiris is another classic example where they put him in history as a pharaoh. There was no such pharaoh. We have a very extensive record of the pharaohs of Egypt because it's one of the most documented ancient societies that we have because of their epigraphic habit. And so, and the sands, which preserve a lot of information because they're dry. Um, so, so we can actually show that these are just made up stories. And when you go further, further back, these gods become more and more celestial, not more and more historical, right? So they, they clearly start out as celestial beings that people believe exist. And then later they start making them political historical actors. And so when you look at the trend of all of these gods, and then you look at Hercules and he fits the pattern, say most likely, Hercules is just another one of these celestial deities that got historicized gradually over time. Um, and against that is nothing. There's no evidence or argument to argue the op opposite position. So, <laughs> so there's no reason to believe that there was a historical Hercules. And the same thing with, with Jesus, right? So it's important to note that my upper bound, my margin of error is one in three for Jesus. So yeah, I'm admitting it's possible there was some guy that started it all. It's just not the most likely explanation. Same with uh, Hercules and Dionysus and all the others. I just want to give everybody a heads up. I found another PhD, Harvard a PhD professor who actually probably doesn't even necessarily know your work. Maybe he has awareness. I don't know. I didn't ask him. And he said that he thinks Jesus probably didn't exist. Now, he probably doesn't like the label or any pigeonholing of a label. And he's just like, yeah. yeah. He said, did Dionysus exist? No. And I see Jesus like I see Dionysus. This is what he said on my interview. That's yeah. on my Patreon mm -hmm. by now. So anyone who wants to join the Patreon can actually watch it. I was shocked to hear. Oh, yeah. Did you send me the link to that? I, I, would, I, I think you did, but I'm not sure. You should totally do that so I could add him to my growing list. Uh, yeah, I scholars. definitely will. I will. Awesome. Moving on. MJT532, did Daniel Stoke Mac revolt or was he a pacifist? Did Daniel Stoke revolt? I think it's the Maccabean I assume they mean revolt. The, I assume they mean the authors of Daniel. Right. Um, the, re the reason being is that the book of Daniel represents Daniel as hundreds of years earlier uh, than the Maccabean revolt, right? So the, the forgery basically invents this hero. It's possible there was a legendary Jewish hero, but it, it looks like he's largely invented. Um, that he was a Gentile hero, not a, not a Jewish hero. And so the authors of Daniel just converted him into a Jewish hero, made up a myth, and then pretended to be him writing this book. So it would be the authors of Daniel who are in this question stoking uh, the rebellion. Um, I think it's entirely possible that they're stoking or so endorsing. I, I think there, I mean, there are lots of, they didn't need to stoke it. Like it was already in the making, right? There's lots of political things going on that would have caused the rebellion. Um, but to sort of push it, you know, let's say tip it over the final edge or to get people motivated to fight. Uh, so as propaganda to mobilize the, re the rebellion, once the rebellion has already begun, 
the book of Daniel is definitely written for that purpose. It is written for the purpose of organizing people in revolt. And, and, but whether that means it was the, 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 the Boston Tea Party that, that launched the revolt, you know, it was the final, it was the, the Thomas Paine uh, uh, of uh, the revolution, or whether it was after the fact, something that was written when the revolution is already going to get people riled up and, and, and boost morale and so on. Uh, that we don't know because we, we can't peg exactly um, uh, when it was written and published. Thank you so much. Kristen Whitaker Hood, The Mythic Life. Thank you for the support. Always good to see your super chat and you in the chat. Dr. Carrier has written some great articles on Christians being newfangled pagans. Wondered if he could talk about it. Happy Happy Easter. <laughs> Uh, I think we, you, is the question modern Christians or ancient Christians? Cause th those are two different things. Modern Christians are way the hell more pagan than, than the ancient Christians were. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, Easter is a good example. Uh, everything about Easter is pagan. Everything about Christmas is pagan. Um, the, almost all the great medieval church fathers, they are taking Aristotle and using Aristotle to create a, found, a theological foundation for their entire religion, the Trinity and all of this stuff that they build out logic for, that is totally pagan. You know, like that's, um, so, so yeah, there, there's modern Christianity is way more pagan than, uh, than ancient Christianity. Ancient Christianity is much more Jewish. Uh, it, it has, there's pagan influences, uh, but they're the same kind of influences that are already influencing Judaism at the time, right? So it's, there's not, uh, I, I would say Christianity is more Jewish than pagan, but it does have pagan influences when you look at the ancient model. But it just acquired more and more. Like when you get to the, once you get to the fourth century, the church is just going gangbusters and absorbing all sorts of pagan ideas uh, to, to basically paganize the church. Um, and this is why, one of the reasons why the Jehovah's Witnesses you know, regard the Vatican as, uh, as pagan, like explicitly. Like they, they think all modern Christianity has just been paganized and corrupted uh, and so the Jehovah's Witnesses are the ones who reject the Trinity. That's too pagan. Um, they uh, they reject a bunch of other things that they think are too pagan. Uh, and they go, try to go back to the original texts. Um, one of my girlfriends is an ex-Jehovah's Witness. And she, she always jokes that like, uh, like th they always had the best arguments to prove that they were the one true religion. <laughs> <laughs> because they are literally the most biblical, like the most legitimately biblical, not, not going around claiming they're biblical. They, they actually follow what the Bible says. So like they take seriously when Jesus says that you're not to swear, uh, that you, you, you can't swear. Jesus says this. So who, who are the people who have the exemption for uh, biblical swearing in courts today because of the religious freedom? It's Jehovah's Witnesses because they're listening to Jesus. Jesus said, don't swear. So we can't swear. That's, you know, I mean, it might be a dumb argument, but it's true, at least in, ter in terms of what their gospel says. So um, the Jehovah's Witnesses are the most biblical of Christians that we have today. Uh, all other Christians are just increasingly paganized versions of that. <laughs> I was listening to, uh, I'm going to have David Madison on and uh, his book, 10 Things Christians Wish Jesus Never Taught. And one of those is oh. that hate your mother, your father, your sister, your brother type yeah. things. And yeah. like Jehovah's Witnesses follow that as well. When when someone is not in the kingdom and they're yeah. not following, they will absolutely hate you. They will separate themselves just like an ancient Jim yeah. Jones cult. Like they're following yeah. and that's this. What that, extreme, yeah, that's what that teaching from Jesus is, is, is meant to do. That's the whole right. point is that your fictive kinship. That's the whole your fictive kinship now supersedes family. Uh, so no more family bonds. Uh, if they mm -hmm. if they're leading you astray, they're they're like the people who lead you astray in Deuteronomy, who God commands to be stoned, right? Like that's right. That's the that's what that's what that is about. And um, this is very much a, an apocalyptic cult uh, mindset, right? Is to separate yeah. people from their biological family unless they can convert their family, then they're welcome because now they're part of the fictive kin group. Um, but th that's even what I think is going on in Mark when Jesus. The only occasion in which the brothers of Jesus get mentioned in Mark is this occasion where Jesus, it cr sets up an occasion where Jesus can denounce and renounce his family and declare his followers his true family, right? So here we have an etiological myth establishing the whole fictive kinship model of Christianity and explaining why we're ditching our families and adopting a new family. Uh, and we have Jesus doing it. Uh, and so, so that's, that's a myth. That's not even a real story. That never happened. It's all meant the same way the baptism story is told. It's just told to represent what the Christian teaching is. 
it doesn't have anything to do probably with anything that Jesus himself actually taught, even if he existed. Wow. Thank you so much. The mythic life, Christian. Thank you so much. Love you. Bob Lyle, Dr. Carrier, your book, why I'm not a Christian was the first book I read on my deconversion journey. Wow. Thank you for your work. That's a good book to give to people who are on the fence or willing to read a critic because it's short. So they won't like be, they won't balk at the thickness of it. It's only 90 pages. Um, and I specifically engineered it to do an end round of all of the usual Christian apologetic defenses, the inoculation they try to insert into people to prevent them to be from being moved by atheist arguments. I, I wrote every chapter specifically to dodge around and pre refute all the usual Christian answers. So it's harder for a Christian to argue against that version of why Christianity is false. Um, so it, for that reason, it's super useful. It's also cheap. Uh, so you can get tons of them and hand them out like pamphlets. <laughs> thank you so much, Bob. I'm glad that that helped you. And thank you for the support. Yeah. Ephon 81. Uh, Ephon 81. Thank you for the support. Derek and Dr. Carrier, you're both awesome. Like curious question. What are some of your own unknown guilty pleasures a la games, sci-fi movies, LARPing? <laughs> I have LARPed. Um, that's a thing I do. Uh, I don't know if I, I, I'll avoid scandalous discussions of things I, I do hobby wise. Um, I, I mean, I've done, I've done LARP orgies too, uh, like for real. Um, so <laughs> uh, it's a thing I do. Um, no, let's see what, yeah, I like terraforming Mars. Like I'm a big board game geek. Uh, so wings, I played wingspan, uh, people who don't know what these are. Um, so, uh, so I'm a big board game geek. That's one of the things I do. Um, me and all my friends and girlfriends play those. Um, what else? Um, I guess that's the biggest thing. Uh, and, and I, yeah, obviously I'm a big movie geek too. Uh, so the, I have a few blog articles about that, about my interest in movies um, that you can find on my website. Um, so I'd say, I'd say that mostly. I don't know. Those are the things that come to mind. There are probably others if people would bump my memory and I would <laughs> I'd say that. But For me, uh, my guilty pleasure is uh, I'll play video games. I feel like there's a spider like literally <laughs> me. anyway uh i'll play video games sometimes uh lately uh i like games that take me into a story where i can get lost in it and have to adventure into like this world that you enter into the game and you're kind of stuck in this other world the other um, mm -hmm. um the other game i like is uh call of duty modern warfare i like arguing with six-year-olds you know, so I decided I would <laughs> play that and then the death com and stuff, you know, they're screaming at yeah, me. And I'm like, I, my mom is not ugly. Don't call my mom ugly again. No. Yeah, but uh, I, I don't do video games anymore because I would I would lose all time. Like I would just get absorbed in them. So I, I gave up video games like 20 years ago. Uh, so that, just just so that I don't get sucked in. Basically. Well, it it is guilty pleasure. So, like, that's the question. Like, <laughs> I enjoy reading, of course. I'll sit out here and read books and stuff. But sometimes it's strenuous. Sometimes it's tough. And I have, like, I'll set goals. Like, I got to have this book done because I'm interviewing this person. I want to make oh, sure I, I know should, what I'm doing. I, that reminds Okay. you. See, so you prodded me. That reminds me. I should mention. Yeah, uh, I play role-playing games. So um, I do a lot of D&D, &D, not because I like D&D. &D. I actually don't like D&D, &D, but my friends play it. So, so I join that. Um, a little bit of Pathfinder. Uh, I do some homebrew things that I run. So role-playing games, is that would be, I guess, a guilty pleasure. I don't feel any guilt over it, though. So. <laughs> but it would be a nerdy thing like that, that people wouldn't know about me. Thank you so much, E-Font. Neo Fight one thank you for the support. Dr. Carrier, I'm an old papist and perplexed why a second-century author would project back Jesus-failed apocalyptic prophecy is not the simpler explanation that proto mark originated in Jesus generation and evolved over time. Well, um, it's curious that you were putting Mark in second century. I don't, I don't think that's likely. Um, I think Mark is seventies AD, probably late seventies. Um, no, what Mark is doing is what all, all these, what everybody's what Christians have been doing for 2000 years. Uh, someone makes a prediction and it doesn't come true. And um, 
So what do you do? You reinterpret the prediction so that it was going to come true any time now. And then it doesn't come true. And then someone comes along and then reinterprets it. It's going to happen any time now. Any time now. Generation after generation after generation. Any time now. Uh, and they, they never clue in on this. They say, well, we've been doing this for 2,000 years. Clearly we're wrong. <laughs> no, they never come to that conclusion. They just keep doing it. This is, uh, you look at the polls for Christians today. They all think the world's going to end in their lifetime. It's going to end now. And you go back generation after generation after generation. They always say the same thing for hundreds of years even. Yeah. Um, so what Mark is doing, so it isn't that, so let's assume, let's operate on this, the model that there was no historical Jesus. Um, it doesn't really matter. Uh, even if there was a historical Jesus, he was probably an apocalyptic prophet and probably predicting the end of the world would happen any time now. Mm -hmm. But even if that's not the case, Paul says Jesus is coming to him in visions and saying the world is going to end any time now. Like Paul said, any time now. In fact, Paul has to like, start making excuses for why it hasn't happened, right? It's been 20 years and he's like, well, you know, certain things have to happen, but it's any time, still any time now. Um, and has to come up with, with, you know, other excuses. Well, don't worry about the people who are dying. They'll get resurrected. Don't worry. Uh, I know a lot of people have been dying because Jesus is really late. I don't know why he's taking so long, but <laughs> any time now, right? So this is, this is, you know, this is the fifties AD. And then you have the Jewish war. And all, all mainstream scholars agree that Mark is a response to what happened in the Jewish war. The Jewish war, the Romans, the heathens come in and destroy Judea, destroy Jerusalem, and destroy God's own house, the temple itself. And the world still didn't fucking end. <laughs> right? So this is a problem. Right? This is a serious problem. Like, the yep. world is supposed to end now. Why, what's, why is it still here? Right. And so what is what to, and you have to you have to explain this. Right. So Mark has to explain this. And so he has a lot of like parables in there, like the fig tree parable is about this. Right. It's it's about like, why did God let heathens destroy the temple and then not in the world? Like what's going on? And now Mark tells this story about how Jesus taught through the fig tree and stuff that, well, God decided it's no longer the time for the temple cult. It's now time for the new way, uh, you know, the new covenant and so on. And so, and it's all about, you know, basically evangelism, right? But it's still going to happen anytime, but anytime now. <laughs> and so what does Mark do? He has Jesus. I think Mark is the one who has Jesus say, um, don't worry. Uh, it'll still come within the, the living memory of, of someone, right? So he's basically saying like, uh, it's going to come uh, before the last person of this gener of that generation, mm -hmm. what would have been the 30s generation died, right? So he's basically saying uh, there'll be just one person Maybe he doesn't say one person, but he basically says like, it's going to happen. It's just, we're going to play out this generation basically. So Mark is moving the football down the field. He's saying, well, this is why it didn't end now or it didn't end then, but it's going to end any time now. And there was a popular belief in antiquity that the maximum lifespan for humans was 120 years. This is very, we find this very commonly uh, in, in the lore of the era. And so it was, now that to live 120 years has probably never happened in antiquity, and there, there's probably uh, you know so there's no statistical reality to this, but it was a belief. So that gives you 120 years. If you figure someone's 30 years old when Jesus is walking around, that gives you 90 years, right? So that's so, so if it's going to happen within this generation, you've got 90 years, and you can claim, well, I don't know where the, where the one living guy is, but he's somewhere, right? But when that person dies, and then at the end comes, you know. And eventually this gets turned into the wandering Jew, like the guy who never dies, right? So he, he keeps the prophecy being true by still being alive. Yeah. Uh, and, and so the wandering Jew is still alive today, right? And so that's why the end hasn't, it, it, the prophecy wasn't false. There's still one dude from that generation who's still alive and the end will come when he dies. Uh, and the seven seals, I think it was the seven seals or the seventh seal, not the black and white one, but the Jürgen Prochnow movie uh, was based a lot on this idea. And Jürgen Prochnow plays the the, the, the wandering Jew, the last guy, and then it is, is he has to break the seals, and then when he dies, the world will end, and all this. Um, so, so that's based on that that legend. But, uh, but that's what Mark is doing. So he's moving the football field, or moving the football down the field, and then you look at later authors; they they move it even further in different different ways that they 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 sort of slightly change how this happens. Now, all this stuff happens before. By the time you get to John, he's like, doesn't even come up, right? You know, John's well, one probably right. He's probably second century, right? So, I was going to say, like, at the end of John, the tacked on chapter, it literally like addresses this problem of the 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 beloved disciple whom wasn't supposed to die. They thought the rumors are spreading, like he wasn't 
He is. Oh, it doesn't. Jesus didn't say he wasn't going to die. Like they're already yeah. having Jesus repute. Right. I don't think that has to do with the apocalypticism, though. Uh, really? I think that. Yeah. So first of all, you have to understand John is a redaction. It's the third edition. So mm -hmm. this is if you look at all the like leading experts on John, John has gone through multiple authors who've changed. They've moved things around. They've added stuff, taken stuff away. So our John is different. So that that chapter was added on later. Right. It's a tack on. Um, and it's a tack on. And it, or at least part, most that that section of that chapter definitely is a tack on. There might be parts of it that, that go back to the original. Um, but that particular that line definitely is. And the reason is, is because originally, if you look at the and I analyze this in on the history of, city of Jesus, chapter 10.7, you can go in and I, I have the scholarship and, and I cite the scholarship and, and do the analysis. The gospel was originally written to be Lazarus as the author. So the beloved disciple is Lazarus. And there's a lot of clues to how this, and it might've been explicitly said that originally, but it's gone through so many edits that that got blanked out. But there are enough clues that you can tell that the beloved disciple is Lazarus. So what happened is Jesus resurrected Lazarus. So the question becomes, well, wait a minute. It, as Paul says, if you become resurrected, then you have this glorious, invincible, eternal body. So where's Lazarus? He should be walking around, right? We should be, get to meet this guy. He can't die, right? He has this perfect, glorious body. We should go get to see him. Um, and so, so, the, so there, there had to be a question, well, wait a minute, if Jesus resurrected Lazarus and then he's just going to die again, then that refutes our entire theory of resurrection. Like Jesus didn't really resurrect him. He just resuscitated him, as modern Christian apologists would say. Uh, and so this became a rhetorical problem. And so um, there you are. the... There you are. Uh, Did it do it again? Ah. Oh. Your audio. Yeah, I can't hear you. Damn it. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. All right, so he's going to back out. I, I wonder if he got a phone call. That this... <laughs> These are always so uh, entertaining and educational. I really enjoy your questions and... I, I thank everybody who's helped support make this happen. I pay him for his time, of course, and uh, I really do appreciate that. So, yeah, these are fun. This is good. It's interesting to hear a different r way of looking at this John 21 situation with this disciple that Peter's like, hold on, what, what about this guy? And I always thought it was the disciple that they're trying to get out of the whole earlier stuff in Mark and Matthew and Luke, mainly Mark and Matthew, where he says, some of you standing here will not taste death till the son of man comes in glory, you know, to repay each man according to the deeds with the angels of God, which is the second coming, the idea that we call the second coming, the parousia. And I thought this was a, a response to that. So, okay, he's back. There he is. Okay. You're, yeah. you're pitch black. Oh, there you are. Can you hear me? You're back. Oh, how you're weird. Uh, you can see me? I, I see you me. now, but you're like... My audio's there. But... Oh, there we yeah. go. Okay. <laughs> your audio's right. there, but you're like um, freezing up in your video. So, but Oh, well. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll shorten that up. Basically, that line is a way to say that... I, I Okay, that I just resurrected him, but he, he can die. He's it's, There's going to be a true resurrection later. That wasn't the final resurrection, et cetera. So it's basically just an apologetic fix. They're just fixing a problem that that story created um, by explaining away. And so when he says that he can die, um, that that means that he he wasn't that wasn't the final resurrection of Lazarus. That was just you know a reprieve from death, basically. And so it, it's just a, an apologetic fix. Yeah, uh, it's interesting the way that you describe that, and that makes a lot of sense as well. The, what I was saying, and then we'll get to the next super chat. I was just simply trying to point out. You remember in Mark and Matthew, where Jesus says, "Some of you standing here will not taste death." That's right. Yeah. I I don't know. Is there a way to combine the two? Is it possible that Lazarus, the later gospel, is harping into that tradition in some way, and it's trying to correct that? Hey, this is a disciple, a be the beloved disciple, who did die, but. You know, it's getting away from the felt apocalyptic stuff because Jesus says, I am the resurrection. I know y'all are waiting for it, but no, 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 no. <laughs> this is a whole I, new program. I'm not aware of any evidence of connections between that. Like, like even in the tradition of the wandering Jew, there's no connection to Lazarus that I know of. So, um, 
Now, whether that arose like in the Middle Ages or the late antiquity, I know less about what legends and weird stuff arose then. Um, so I can't say definitively that that didn't happen. But uh, in the Gospels, no, that's not that's not going on. OK, just so everybody knows, I only have 30 minutes left. And uh, Rich Myers, thank you for the super chat. Thank you, Derek and Dr. Carrier. Love you both. Well, I awesome. love you, too. <laughs> thank you. Seriously, I appreciate the love and the support. Joshua Owens, thank you for the super chat as well, my friend. Having problems with Patreon will fix soon. Is the Trinity connected to the Ugaritic Baal El Asherah? Keeping in mind the Holy Spirit had female pronouns early on and Baal were, uh, resurrected and was synchronized with Yahweh. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> um, not directly. Uh, so it's not like they saw Trinitarianism in Baal cult specifically and then immediately they adopt Trinitarianism. That, that didn't happen. Uh, Trinitarianism is not in the Bible. Uh, it's the New Testament. There are no Trinitarians in the New Testament. Not even John, the author of the gospel, is a Trinitarian. Um, the, it, at most, you could say a binatarian, but he's not really even that because, um, you know, the opening of John says, you know, the in the beginning was God, um, or in the beginning was the word, and the word was God or whatever. Um, and uh, But that actually comes from Jewish uh, Merkava mysticism. Um, and you find this in Philo. That that's also true, that uh, the word, the logos, started out as God and then became an emanation. God like separated the logos out as sort of a separate entity, which was the archangel of many names. Uh, and so the archangel of many names was at one time unified with God. But after they separated, they are separate beings. So it's not that they are unified anymore. Right. So this would be a heresy in one of the typical modern trinitarian models but um but this was a jewish there was a widespread jewish belief that this was the case so there were the angels were originally unified with god and it's certainly this one angel who was the, the angel who actually did the creation who actually did all the creating for god and stuff like that mm -hmm. and who runs the universe and does everything for god uh he was he was that angel is the logos and the logos was originally god uh but it, it, that in past tense so so actually in later they're separate they're not identical uh, and that makes him a created being. The, the archangel of many names, the Logos, is a created being insofar as he's an emanation of God that God created, uh, but imbued him with the Logos, which was a part of God. So, so they're connected in that sense. Uh, John is only describing that, which is not even non-Jewish, much less Trinitarianism. Uh, and that's key because it's the past tense. He says the, the Logos was God, was emphasis on past tense. Uh, Whereas it doesn't say the Logos is God. It doesn't say Jesus is God, right? So, so that's not even Trinitarianism. So there's no Trinitarianism in, uh, in the New Testament at all. That is a late invention. It appear, the idea of it appears to get started around like the third century. Um, you get notions of it from Tertullian. So that'd be the late second, early third century. Um, it doesn't become mainstream until Council of Nicaea, right? So, um, and that... That is a the Trinitarianism of the Nicene Creed is a complete fabrication of the Nicene Council. It did not exist. There was no sect of Christianity that held that view of Trinitarianism at all before that committee invented that version of it. Mm. Uh, it was completely a committee creation. And if you know anything about like the garbage that committees make, that's what they made, <laughs> right? Um, the best explanation for for this, the politics behind this fabrication of this new Trinitarian idea. Um, is best explained in uh, Bart Ehrman's book, um, uh, How Did Jesus Become God? So at the end of that book, Ehrman has like a chapter or two on how did it go from what he's talking about to, um, the whole book is good on this, by the way. I completely agree with the model that Ehrman finally adopts in How Jesus Became God um, for the explanation of this, that Jesus started out separate. He's not a, he's a created being. He's um, an angel. He's not unified with God. There's no Trinitarianism in Paul or anywhere in the Gospels. Uh, there's nothing in Jewish about this. There's uh, Ehrman does a good job of explaining how this is actually fully Jewish, the idea of these, these the way that Pauline and even Gospel teachings about Jesus fit. Uh, and then, but later you get all these ideas about how do you make this make sense? And they're actually more and more pagan, right? So this idea of how you're unifying Jesus, making Jesus be identical to God, these are like pagan uh, efforts to do things. And so, um, and there are a lot of different sects and they're competing. By the time you get to the Nicene Creed, there's this political decision is who's in and who's out. And whoever's in, 
their creed gets mashed in and whoever's out words get mashed in that reject them. And so the creed is this, this political device that is designed to include and exclude specific sects of, of things for political reasons, not any kind of scriptural or ideological, theological reasons. It's all politics. And, and Ehrman has a good, shows how the, the different versions of this end up being mashed together in the Nicene Creed and why. And it's the best explanation I've seen of this. So people who want to see how that came about, it's in there. Uh, so, so there is there is no Trinitarianism in that. So it comes about later through local politics of the church itself. It doesn't really have anything directly to do with paganism. Uh, but the attractiveness of the Trinitarian idea is pagan. It's everywhere. So, so the fact that they would come up with this attractive model, like that they would find this model attractive because everybody else does, um, that, that makes sense, right? So you could say, and so it's not just Baal cult specifically. There's the Capitoline triad of Rome. Um, there are all these trinities, lots of religions. Uh, Egypt has a trinity. There's different kinds of trinities. And their their underlying ontology is different. There's all different ways to explain these trinities. Um, and so uh, they're not like the Nicene Trinity. That, that didn't exist anywhere in paganism or anywhere else. Nicene Trinity is this weird, bizarre Frankenstein's monster that that committee invented. Uh, and like I said, they invented it for, for political reasons, not to emulate pagans. But But the fact that Trinitarianism was very popular all these different kinds of Trinitarians is very popular, might have been a slight motive in why they wanted to build their own and use that to basically control who's an insider and who's an outsider of the church. Wow. Thank you, Joshua Owens. A Theologica, Derek Bennett is in the house. He says, Dr. Carrier, grab the will and yell, I want to go fast. I want to go fast! <laughs> <laughs> you did it! That's awesome. And that brand new car of his. Thank you so it's much, not brand Derek. New. It's used, but well, it's new it's to me. New to you. Yeah. yeah, that's all that matters, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank actually, you so much. A huge improvement from what I had. I was driving a 2000 Camry LE. I'm now driving a 2017 RAV4. So it's definitely 17 years moved up into the future. It's excellent. There you go. Thank you so much. P, thank you for the super chat. Are you doing a Jesus from Outer Space audiobook? Oh, God, yes. I, I know. I'm so sorry. So sorry I haven't finished that. Um, I've been struggling to find the time to get the recording done. That, that's just the, the answer. I've just been too busy with work, life, um, family stuff, uh, especially like everything, things go wrong. Like I was ready to do it and then the pandemic hit and then I was ready to do it. And then my mom died and then I was ready to, you know, so it's like, yeah. uh, like, so things keep happening. And so I keep pushing it back and I'm, I'm way, way behind on doing that audio. And I, I apologize. I, I, I really dislike the fact that I haven't gotten that audio out yet. So it is on my list and I keep trying to get it done, but it's other things keep intruding and uh, taking up the time slots. So, uh, Thank you so I, I can't, I can't project. I'm, I'm a fail to predict uh when it will be out but eventually it's coming I'm soon gonna do it. it's it's gonna no, it's, i don't know i can't promise that but I, it I will happen I within wanna. this generation it will happen yeah, within i absolutely this have to get it done and so uh, it's on my list and it keeps moving on my calendar so eventually will some of us watching here not taste death before the uh audio book comes? <laughs> okay okay i i that i can promise i can promise unless i die uh before i do it um through some yeah. freak accident uh th th yeah i will definitely get it done within that timeline yeah let's hope that doesn't happen yeah <laughs> great graze 174 the fig tree question wasn't just a joke is the only response that miracles are impossible i was told a church father had this take close to the time um well yeah i mean the church fathers have all kinds of weird double the whole theory of double truth right is that we get this in origin is that all of this stuff could be both allegorical and literal. Um, but that's a theological fabrication. There's no, there's no historical empirical reason to believe that that ever happens, right? So, um, and it's not that miracles are impossible. It's that they're the least probable explanation of anything, right? Uh, you know, if, if, if someone tells a wild story at the top of the list, literally the most probable, because it's the most frequent cause of those things, is that they're making shit up. That's, that's number one. Uh, and then way, way, way down, way down there is a very small probability that it was a real thing that got exaggerated or misinterpreted. And then millions and billions of times below that 
is oh it really was a miracle <laughs> right so it is literally the least least probable explanation of anything uh so so there then there's no basis for arguing otherwise um so that's i mean that's that's why historians no longer use miracle claims as propositions as premises and arguments for history because they know the frequency the frequency of making stuff up is so absurdly high mm -hmm. that you need tremendous amount of evidence to confirm that this isn't just one more made up story. Uh, and so um, without that evidence, you have no reason to believe that it's even likely. Okay. So just a heads up, we only have 20 minutes left and we have quite a bit of uh, super chat. So I don't know if uh, there's a way to focus your answers as much as possible to get to them. Um, I don't want to leave anybody yeah, hanging. Let's do Going, a speed round. Let's see what we can do. Well, I, some of them maybe take a little bit of, you know, explanation. <laughs> I don't want to leave anyone hanging, but that's why I mentioned that because I only have so much time with you. I pay you for your time. Mm -hmm. Christian Michael, thank you for the super chat again. This goes back to that original question that we needed algebraic, like, deciphering. Okay. So the Got essence yeah. of my question, he says, given that the mystery of the mature is demonstrably equal formation of Christ in believers... And the context shows Paul's counter example to rulers. Why would they be demons? Do you get the question? I I get half the question. Not sure where they're going with it. Um, it sounds like they're saying something about how Paul believed the church is the body of Christ uh, because the spirit of, of Christ inhabits them. And so they are the hands and feet and whatnot of, of Jesus. And that's also why they'll be resurrected. Um, but of course, that's all post-resurrection stuff. So the church being the body of Christ only became a thing in his narrative after the death of Jesus. Um, whereas the killing of Jesus, obviously, by definition, predates the resurrection of Jesus. So um, the, pre pre you know, it pre predates the death of Jesus because it is the death of Jesus. Um, trying to explain the, the reason why uh, we have, the reason we have good reason to suspect um, that there, we're talking about demonic forces. And even Origen, the church father, admitted that Paul's talking about demonic forces in this passage, that they're the ones that crucified uh, Paul. But they, it, here we get back to the double truth, where he says, well, they, they did it through the agency of the Roman powers. But that's not what Paul says. He doesn't mention any agency or of Roman authorities. He says the opposite. In Romans 13, he says that all the authorities are placed there by God, and they cannot but do the will of God, essentially. Like, like if they were going to counteract god's plans he would get rid of them so uh so paul has this whole chapter on chapter 13 in romans about how the authorities are actually they're, they're there for god they're they're only carrying out god's purpose um which contradicts the first corinthians 2 passage right it's just like how how could they thwart deliberately act so as to thwart god's plan if they can't you know disobey god right right they can't, god would just remove them right <clears throat> so what what Paul says there is that the reason they killed Jesus is that they God tricked them into not knowing that that would defeat their plans and enact his plans, which means that had they known that, they would have refrained from executing Jesus. They said, oh, well, if we execute Jesus, then we lose power over death in the world uh, and God wins. And, and so and there's only one group of people who have that interest and that ability, and that's demonic powers. The Romans weren't wizards. They didn't have control over death in the world, right? So there, there's no sense in which they would even accept, like even if they, even if you were to tell them, you know, if you kill Jesus, it's going to save the world. Um, they'd be like, okay, great. One more reason to kill Jesus. Excellent. Uh, they're not going to say, oh, shit, we better refrain from killing Jesus because we, we want to prevent everyone from being saved, right? Like that's, that was not logic that Romans would ever engage in. Not even if they believe the person, which they wouldn't, right? So right. If, if you're to say, "Oh, it's got part of God's plan," uh, you know, the, 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 you're gonna if you kill Jesus, it's gonna topple all the Roman powers because all the demons will be defeated, etc. And the Romans are gonna like, "Yeah, whatever. You're full of shit. We're killing the guy," right? Like they're not even gonna believe the the God's plan thing, much less act to thwart God's plan they don't believe in. Uh, but even if they believed it they wouldn't act toward it. There's only one group of people in the, the cosmos, according to Paul's worldview, uh, that really did want to keep death in the world and really did want to keep their powers over uh, the sublunar sphere uh, and, and not let God end things uh, that would end their domain. There's only one group, and that's the demons. And so that's why it's pretty obvious that the archons of this aeon means demonic forces. 
And so really, I think the only logical course for this for historicists is to go origins route and say that, yes, that's what Paul is saying. It's totally what Paul is saying. But he means that they did it through the agency of earthly powers, um, like Origen says. Now, I think that contradicts Romans 13, and there's no way that, that Paul would, would have meant that. And more importantly, Paul does not say that. So you can't, you can't claim, even at best, it's 50-50, right? You can't claim that Paul's referring to Romans here and, and Jews here because he doesn't mention them. So maybe he is, maybe he's not. So you can't use this verse as evidence for the historicity of Jesus because it is equally explicable on either theory. And I think when you look at all the evidence, it's more explicable on the non-existence theory than on the historicity theory. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Margaret DeVelden. Mark Penn's a failed, hey, pro uh, Hi. failed prophetic Jesus. Why would Council of Trent include Mark? I think it's Council C.O. Trent. Are we wait, uh, are we talking Why about Why would the... C.O. Trent include Mark? Are we talking about the canon, I guess, is the question. Maybe. It's um, of... Yeah, so I have an article called uh, Three Things to Know About the New Testament on my blog. Uh, it's a good place to start. I have one of those three things is that the canon, the idea of a canon uh, is a late uh, assignment. The, the, what was in the canon was already picked before it was declared canon. And what happened is, and David Trobish is the one who shows this with manuscript evidence, that someone who assembled the New Testament as we know it in the second century, mid second century, he's made arguments that he thinks Polycarp is the one who did this. I, I think that's speculating, uh, but it's around the time of Polycarp. Someone assembles the, the four gospels and a, a collection of letters and revelation and all of this stuff and put together what we call the New Testament. Um, they might've added a few other books that didn't end up in the long run, but uh, we're not really sure. But certainly the four gospels were very key to this edition. And this edition was edited together to combat the original first edition of the Bible, which was Marcion's. So Marcion is the first one to, do, to publish a collection, which would be called the New Testament, right? A collection of these books um, together. He's the first one to do this. And so all the enemies of Marcion needed, they realized they needed to get in the game. So they, they came out with an anti-Marcionite Bible, a response to, the, to his. And that's the one we have. Now, when they did this, they, they made the selection of four Gospels. And th those four Gospels stuck at every council thereafter, when they actually started having councils to decide this stuff, which was not then, but much later. Every council after, they just kept rubber stamping what was already the popular version of their, their book, right? Uh, and this is the version that was uh, sort of unofficially canonized by Eusebius. Like he wrote the whole, the canons of the New Testament. Um, so they're very much like sticking with what other people had already put stamp of authority on. So by the time councils are making these decisions, the decision had already been made, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, the, they already, there's already a fixed Bible. You really can't mess with it. Uh, so all they can do now is rubber stamp it, essentially, is what's going on. Um, and the reason they take these four contradictory Gospels, and they are contradictory, is because they want to include as many sects on their side against the Martian side as possible without including too many enemies, right? Like So, so they want the Jewish church to be on their side. So that's why they pick Matthew. They want the Pauline, the Paulinists. So that's why they pick Mark. Um, they want the um, accommodationists. So that's Luke where he wants the Jewish faction of the church and the Gentile faction to get, get along. Mm -hmm. That's Luke. So they want that community. And then the, the radical Johannites, they want them. Uh, and then all the other gospels that there were, like the gospel of Peter, were too heretical from their perspective. They were too much in the vein of Martian and his side. So they excluded them in order to exclude the communities that use those gospels. So it's just like the Nicene Creed as a, as a Frankenstein's monster. The canon or what was the proto canon, this Bible is also a Frankenstein's monster. The decisions were political, not theological. So they're including gospels specifically to get the churches in that use those gospels. And then they figure we can just gloss over all the contradictions later with apologetics, right? just exactly as they did with the trinity where the trinity is completely nonsensical bullshit and then they, they have to, they're constantly doing apologetics to defend and make sense of it for thousands of years <laughs> you know for over a thousand years after so um, Jeez. that's that's my take on it and that jives with what david trobish has, has argued and, and other scholars who talk about how did these canonical books get how did these books get chosen for that anti-martianite uh bible once that is done later 100 200 years later 
councils start rubber stamping that Bible, but the Bible was already being produced with the four the fourfold gospel for centuries before councils even got involved. Thank you, Margaret. Appreciate that. MJT five three two again. Did Jesus teach works salvation? Sheep, goats. Yeah, it's hard to answer that question because it's it's the question is not even wrong. Like so, um, like it, it's off. This is a modern Christian debate, um, and it might starts in late antiquity, uh, but um, it's a false dichotomy. So there is no no such debate actually in the debate is fabrication, right? This is no such debate between faith versus works in the New Testament. It doesn't exist. Uh, it's read into the New Testament by later Christians who see it that way, but that's not what's going on. Um, that's not what's going on in the, the epistles of James or the epistle from James, etc. It's not what's going on in Paul. Um, the reality is more bizarre because the way atonement theology actually worked back then, it, it's literally blood magic. Like it's illogical, superstitious, blood magic, weird shit. Um, and it's only when people start rejecting all of those supernatural, superstitious, blood magic stuff that now this dichotomy becomes a problem. It didn't exist as a problem back then. And the way Paul's teaching it is, what he's teaching is the same thing that Jews teach for Judaism. And if you look at that and it's like, okay, so as you go through life, you accumulate sin, like this stain of sin, like this some sort of supernatural goop, that ectoplasm that gets in you. And it, it, God doesn't like it and, and can't, can't admit you into heaven, can't resurrect you if you're covered in this gook. And so the only way to get rid of it is to cast a spell, uh, cast a magic spell that cleans all the invisible gook off of you. Uh, and one of those spells is the Yom Kippur, and that, that cleans all of Israel. Uh, so you have this big temple magic ceremony in the, this, this animal sacrifice, the blood magic, cleanses all of Israel. Uh, everybody who's in the covenant, so you have to be in the covenant, uh, cleanses them all of the sin gook. But, but you have to do that every year because the gook accumulates throughout the year, uh, right? You keep sinning. And so like, you, so every year you get this stuff cleaned off. And then Leviticus has all these rules for how you can like keep yourself clean with all these minor sacrifices, doves and all these other things that you can like, you commit a sin, you go to the temple and you get a little temporary like license to get rid of the gook and the spell is cast. The priest does his thing. Uh, and so like this, this is nonsensical mojo weird shit, right? But this is how they thought. This is literally how they thought this worked. And so when you look at Hebrews 9, that's what the Christians are doing. They're just replacing the temple with Jesus. So right. they're saying, well, you go through this baptism ritual, you get attached spiritually, like to the actual gook of Jesus, like this invisible spirit gook. And that gook purges you of all the sin gook all the time. So you don't have to have the temple. You don't need the Yom Kippur anymore. You don't need to bring the doves to the priest. You don't need to do any of that stuff. You're just, once you're in, you're in. Uh, and Paul even says this like about one guy that they expel from the church. He says, expel him to leave his body to Satan. Uh, but, but they're still going to be saved. Like their body is going to be, you know, Satan's going to ravage their body while they're alive, but they're still saved. Is this, this is the guy who uh, slept with magic, his mother, It's a magic right? spell. What's that? The guy that slept with his mother in Corinthian yeah, church. Yeah, something like that, right. And... And so this, so this is the idea, but you still had to, like, the idea was aspirational idea of ethics is that if the spirit is animating you, you're going to do good works. And if you're not doing good works, that suggests the rot, you didn't really have the spirit of Jesus in you. Right. Uh, and so that, so there's the question of, there was a tension between, uh, if people keep sinning after their baptism, well, then why? Right. So, uh, and, and so Paul's take on this was, well, you'll be saved, but your life will be hell. God's going to ravage you and like, like things are going to go badly for you just as it goes badly for everybody. But eventually you'll get saved like because you know, you're in. You, you've, you voted in, basically. Um, and, and even when people talk about like works are important, even they are actually buying into this idea, but they're still talking about the same thing as this idea. Of, well, if you're animated by the Spirit, you should be doing good works. And if you're not, Maybe you need to get back with God because there might be you're you're disconnected, right? There's something wrong. Uh, you're you're not actually connected up to the Jesus gook um, like you thought you were. So maybe you need to do that, right? And so, so it's not so much that you you have to choose faith over works, is that they're trying to find a way that you have to have both, right? Uh, and so that's the tension that's going on. And there aren't sides in this debate. It's not like one person saying faith only, one person saying works only. They're both saying both. You have to have both. And they're trying to work out how that makes logical sense 
given their weird superstitious beliefs about blood magic. Um, and this wouldn't be a problem if they didn't have any of those weird superstitious beliefs about blood magic, right? So <laughs> it's, uh, it's the only reason why this is a problem. Um, but now later it becomes a bigger problem once you get rid of the supernatural explanation that even gets rid of the, the fundamental idea of it. And so then you have to explain why are we even talking about faith being relevant? And that's the other thing is it's also not faith. It's important to note that it's not faith. That's a, that's a later invention. It has nothing to do with belief. It's all physics, right? So it's like, it's, did you go through the baptism? Was the spell physically cast on you? That it's, it's not about whether you believe in anything is, did you go through the magic ritual? That's, that's, that's it, right? That's in Paul. That's in James. That's everybody agrees. You have to go through the magic ritual to be part of the new covenant and just get the benefit, the magical benefits of this. It doesn't have to do with believing anything. It's not like belief magically makes you saved. Nothing to do with belief. Uh, it all has to do with the magic, the literal physics, this, this weird, bizarre ontology of how physics works. Um, and, and it's only later that belief becomes important. Once you get to like the church is trying to control ideology, now belief makes you an insider, an outsider, right? So now it's important to politicize belief. That wasn't a case uh, originally. Okay, so we, we've got literally four and a half till we hit our time. So can you yeah, help me well, knock out these have? questions? One, two, three. How many more do we have? Four. Did you say three? Okay. I'm counting right now. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. That's a lot. I know, but a lot of them are just like praises real quick that we can blow through, but the a few of them are yeah. questions. Let's so, just keep right. going. Um the, the only thing limiting me right now is I'm getting hungry. Um, okay, so, don't worry. We're, we're knocking these yeah. out. This is it. No more super chat questions. Yeah. Um, if you if you want to throw us Let's praise, you can. But the Suna says, hey, Derek, hope you're doing well. As usual, nice show. Boom. There's one knocked out. Thank you so much for the support. I really appreciate that. Uh, another one. Chris says, a guy named Carrier carries all of us. Jesus mythicist. Suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Chris, for the uh, super chat, the praise. Really appreciate that. Uh, I will butcher your name. Uh, is it Bertil? I, I I apologize if I've messed up your first name. The gospel writers go to great lengths not to portray Pilate, and by extension, Rome, negatively. Why cast him as an executioner in the first place? Yeah. Um, so the question is, why Pilate? Because you, you look at... Uh, there are other, you know, the Talmud doesn't have it. Pilate, the Talmud has it. Somebody else. Um, it's the, the the Jewish Sanhedrin that does it. Um, so why choose Pilate? Um, I think so. It's not so much that they're worried about offending Romans, because even Romans hated Pilate, right? So <laughs> you know, Tacitus has no is not fond of Pontius Pilate at all, um, and and Josephus freely criticizes Pilate. Uh, and Josephus is doing it under the thumb of the Vespasians, you know, the Roman empires. So, right. so that, so there's no propagandistic reason to soft pedal Pilate's involvement. I think what they're doing is there's, there's, it's, there's broader allegories of what the mission is that the world powers are conspiring together against them and that they're both the Roman order and the Jewish order are oblivious to what's actually happening. That they, they are it basically is turning them into the archons of this Aeon that they don't know what they're doing. Uh, and yet the, the, the political process it goes through and it happens. And the way they show Pilate acting is very much more a criticism of the Jewish elite than it is of the Roman elite, uh, because it's showing Pilate being easily manipulated by the Jewish elite, and it's all they're doing. And even like the public, the Jews in the audience are the ones who drive Pilate to finally do it, to crucify Jesus. But of course the message is that he had to, right? This is all part of God's plan, so Pilate has to do it. Um, but he does it in ignorance. Uh, and, and that's the message, I think, is that the, the authorities will, will inevitably just carry out God's plans. But, they, but if they're not part of our movement, they'll do it ignorantly. They won't know uh, that they're doing it. Uh, and so it's important to include both world powers. Uh, the Roman Empire, because it has to be part of the story because they are a controlling society. So it's part of the message. When you see the, the version in the Talmud that's outside uh, the Roman Empire, it's in, from Babylon. It's the Babylonian Talmud. So this is a version of Christianity that's not in the Roman Empire. It would be in the Parthian Empire. Um, the, uh, that version makes it the, the Jewish authorities that just replaced the Greek authorities. Um, they're the ones who, who do it. Because so, there is no Roman authority to implicate anymore. 
So there, there's no Roman authority to include uh, in this. And so uh, I think what the stories that get told in the Roman Empire have to be stories about Roman politics and the Roman Empire because they need to include all the worldly powers in their narrative. And so I think that's how they came up with it. Thank you so much. Blake says, sorry if asked already, and it wasn't. What are your thoughts on the curse amulet reportedly found on Mount Ebal, Israel allegedly containing oldest Yahweh reference? I don't know anything about that, so I can't comment now. Okay, I will. By the way, Blake, I will be having experts in the field come on who are obviously going to disagree with Dr. Stripling's uh, conservative stance on this, by the way. Uh, Tim uh, Moss. Okay, yeah, I don't, I don't know the controversy, so. Yeah, it, I'll fill you in later when you're not hungry and we're talking. It's also not my field, I should <laughs> right. say. Like, if we're, if we're going that far back, you need Semitic studies, someone who's doing history in that period. Right. Thank you so much for the super sticker, Tim Moss. I was looking to see if you had a question. Just wanted to make sure I covered that. Doesn't look like you do. I really appreciate the support, my friend. Getting to the next one. Oh, here awesome. he is. Tim Moss, again, thank you for the support. Thank you for bringing Dr. Carrier. Dr. Carrier, do you have any thoughts on Christine Hayes' lecture on the Old Testament? We were just talking about her before we hit record. I yeah, know it's I, quite I, old, but I think it's one of the best I've watched on YouTube. Yeah, I haven't watched it, so I can't comment. Sorry. <laughs> I think I, she's I almost amazing. I never watch YouTube things, so I wouldn't. It's 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 just I just don't have time for YouTube, basically. Um, and I, I don't have time for one what I perceive as one one stuff. Um, I have, I have to devote my time to other things. So I, so I don't know anything about that. I can't comment on it, unfortunately. Okay. Well, you did tune into my Robin Faith Walsh interview. She was I did. Remarkable. And that was really good. And yeah, she taught me some things that was very interesting about Petronius and other stuff. Yeah. Um, the Satyricon too. Uh, yeah. I went ahead and got me a copy. Cause I was like, you know oh, what? Have you read I it had yet? To. It's fun. I haven't, I haven't, but I am going to for sure. I'm going to try and see if I catch anything that, she hasn't you know or something yeah if it's and already say, making like, go ahead sorry yeah she was adding interpretations where she thinks that they're making fun specifically of the gospels and i mean i, I found her arguments persuasive i'd have to read like the whole, her whole analysis to really know uh, yeah. whether it holds up but uh it's long been recognized that the, the satiricon is making fun of popular religion in general mm. so uh so it is definitely like it is a satire of um of religion. And so there's a lot of stuff in it that's making fun of mystery cults and religious beliefs. Like, cause the whole guy goes on this big quest to resurrect his penis. And, and it echoes a lot of the novels of the time, which is about these quests for resurrection and eternal life and things like that. And so, uh, and so, so they're mocking this idea that, Oh, he, he sees his, his uh, uh, impotence as the death of his penis. And he has to go on this great quest to find it, what God can actually resurrect his penis. And so that, that's, that's clearly making fun of resurrection cults and mystery cults in general. Uh, and so it, 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 so it tells us a lot about who's making fun of these things. And when you see comedies, it tells you like what's in the air at the time, like what kinds of stories are being made fun of. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tim Moss. X and music. Great show again, Derek. Always enjoy hearing Dr. Carrier. So do I. I, I really do. I always learn something new from you. And by yeah, the and way, there's always great oh, questions too. This this we've been doing this for two hours and they're all I mean, they're really good questions. So I always enjoy being on this show uh, and getting to talk about this stuff. I do want everyone to know I'm gonna try and put something together. I don't know, hopefully later this year. It's gonna I've just got so much going on. I'd like to do some courses with you and and make it out there to California again this year to do in person recordings for these yeah. courses. But also, potentially, we could do some recordings as well while you're there. And, of course, Dennis McDonald, too. So, anyway, I always enjoy it. But maybe before yeah, then, I'll have you back on again. Yeah, sure. Yeah, right. I mean, anytime, anytime. Yeah. Robert Mahaney, thank you so much. I seriously appreciate the support. I did not see awesome. a question. And, of course, our friend uh, Chris, Kristen Whitaker uh, this is great show. I hope more people will support both Derek and Richard's work. It's about learning to think critically about religion. Best wishes to both of you always. I had to get that on the way. Stan, thank you for the support. Stan, and you have a question concerning Jesus' resurrection. Apparently, a lot of people don't know what happens after you reach about 10,000 feet in altitude. <laughs> uh, no, actually, I did not know. Um, now, there were, there were debates about where the atmosphere... So there's a difference between the atmosphere and the lower sphere of heaven, which these are different things. Um, there were some, like some Stoics, uh, and 
was, I think it was the Stoics primarily, maybe some Aristotelians, believed the atmosphere went to 40,000 miles. Um, and, and then it was something else from there to the moon. Uh, but they did have an accurate idea of what, how far it was to the moon, about 200,000 miles. They had that figured out. Uh, and so the, most philosophers, certainly garden variety, like uh, the kind of yokel philosophers that, that dominate religions, uh, had a simplistic view of everything below the moon was one entity. Now, whether it was specifically air or fire or what, what substance filled that gap, um, some substance filled that gap. So from our perspective, it would be the atmosphere goes all the way to the moon and keeps going. Uh, so the ether, beyond the moon, it's the ether, right? This is a, a rarefied atmosphere. It's a different atmosphere. There were some philosophers, the atomists in particular, Epicureans and so on, who believed in the uh, extraterrestrial vacuum. That They thought that once you get beyond the atmosphere, it's a vacuum, uh, which turn, that turns out to be correct. Uh, but no one, and we have, a, we have a passage from Galen where he talks about this debate. Uh, where he says, well, is it a vacuum out there or is it full of stuff? Um, is it full of some sort of gas? And Galen says, well, I don't know. I, until someone goes up there, we really can't answer this question. And so, so Galen's like uh, an empir a true empiricist, right? He says, we can't resolve this question. Um, so that, that was the gamut of views at the time. But the most popular views, the views that got adopted by religions, were the atmosphere goes all the way to the top of heaven, all the way to the stars. Uh, and, and it might be a different substance at different levels, but it's all some sort of substance. And there are animals, uh, creatures appropriate to each sphere that live in the whole thing. And this is how they understood the cosmos to work. And the ones who were more correct to science, the atomists, were also the most hostile to religion, which is why their view of things was the least popular among theologians. So that's why you don't see a lot of atomist understanding of the cosmos showing up in Christianity or anywhere else in the early period. Um, they were outright condemned as atheists, the atomists. Uh, we have this in origin. He even condemned like half the, most of the Aristotelians he condemned because after Aristotle, you have Strato comes along and he's merging atomism with Aristotelianism and he's one of these vacuum theorists. So, uh, so you know, so you can't have that, right? So... <laughs> Um, anyway, that's, that's, I that's have to refer people to case. your book. I have to refer people to your book. You've written a book on ancient science and the Roman, uh, era, the, you know, in ancient yeah. times and oh my gosh, you, this is like a very long book to listen to on audible. And I listened to, I'd say 75% before I interviewed you. And I was like, there's no way I'm ever even going to come close to remembering 90 percent of what i just listened to i just it's unbelievable yeah. but seriously you're just a freaking encyclopedia man I, I don't know how you do it so yeah that the two books on ancient science are both based on my dissertation so that was my actual work at columbia um yeah it's a wealth of information and, and it was meant to be oh, yeah. it's meant to be kind of like a reference book because a lot of the stuff doesn't get put in one place uh, in the field Thank you so much, Stan, for that question. Vaguely agnostic. Thank you for Dr. Carrier's time. Thanks, Derek, for doing what you do. I appreciate that. Impossible is nothing. May Dr. Carrier remark on Daniel's 2,300 day prophecy. Seventh day Adventists say it dates years. It dates years from Ar Xerxes decree in Ezra to Jesus' oh. birth correctly. I, I can't remember. I can't remember this. So uh, I can't comment on it on the fly here. Um, there's a lot of commentary on this, and it varies. Uh, so I would say if, if you want to question the Seventh-day Adventist interpretation, I would never trust theologians to get any of this right. Um, I would check the commentaries. So there, the Hermeneia commentary is the best one on Daniel. Um, so there, there will be, be a section. right? John Collins, I, I think. think. I think so. Yeah, and, and that's a really good one. And it, and it references all the different ways to understand this and gives a scholarly response to this based on, based on evidence and what we can and can't know um, rather than a theological bias. So uh, I would recommend checking there for the answer to that question. I, I personally, you. offhand, I suspect that's not meant to be uh, years. That's Because it's actually, it's, that's the three and a half years that is actually part of the chapter nine prophecy. So I, I think they're, they're they're meant to be days, not years, um, and and it has something to do with their prediction of the end of the world any time now. It'll just remember we've went, gone through this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I think it has I, it has more to do with immediate concerns of trying to retrofit math to explain current events, basically. 
Thank you so much. Impossible is nothing. Deborah Grace, good to see you. Author of Crucifying the Bible. Get you a copy. Cheers, guys. Verily, his blood is drink. Thank you so much for the support. <laughs> She's awesome. I actually went to eat dinner with her and her husband uh, not too long ago. Awesome. Um, cool. Albert, thank you for the super chat. And you have, did you get, did you give me a question, Albert? Good to see you here, by the way. Um, I did not see one. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, he's responding yeah. to people. But I'm thank glad you. to see the support. But yeah, and this then is awesome. Last one here, Louis Alero. I hope I'm saying your name, Alero. Forgive me. If you were to write on the historicity of Jesus again, would you change anything, content and or format? Yeah, li well, small things. Um, I, I am in contract to do a second edition of On the Historicity of Jesus. Um, the corrected edition might already be out. Uh, there was a typo corrected edition that made some uh, minor uh, corrections to different things, um, but mostly typos and stuff like that or, or corrected references and stuff. Um, but I, I am actually have notes for doing a second edition, and there's some things I would do a little bit differently. They're not ma major things. And I think there are mostly things where someone's reading a sentence and not correctly interpreting what I meant. Uh, and so that now that I see what they're reading wrong, I know how to reword it so to prevent them from doing that. Uh, so there's, there's a few, few things like that where I would rephrase things. Uh, and there's plus a few pieces of evidence that I left out that I should put back in. Um, so there's more, there's more evidence regarding um, backing up the idea of the cosmic sperm bank. So for instance, we know, I don't mention in On the History of Jesus, but I do mention in Jesus from Outer Space that there was a Talmudic belief in the angel of night who goes around, collects semen from men's testicles, flies it up to God and asks God to identify each piece of semen, whether it's going to be a rich man, a poor man, yada, yada, and, uh, and then takes it back down and reinserts it into the testicles of each man. And uh, which shows that, like, that that's, this is the kind of weird belief they had, that this, this, you could do this. And if you could do this, then obviously God could say, hey, I'm going to hold on to this one sperm here, right? So like, there's no reason why that wouldn't be a completely rational, ordinary belief for someone who believes in this angel of night thing, right? So, uh, so I think that that's important evidence that needs to be included. And I, I don't have it in on the history of Jesus, but I do mention it in Jesus from outer space. There's also like Zoroastrian precedents for this. So there's like, there's been some evidence. Uh, and then the other thing is, um, I think it's worth including some sort of response to the academic reviews, which were all very dishonest uh, and misrepresented what's actually in on the history of Jesus. Um, but that also leads to like how to point that out and to explain why that's not responding to the book, essentially. So I, I, if second edition, I would include some of that kind of stuff. So if the tooth fairy angel comes tonight and tries to sneak off with your semen, just watch out. <laughs> um, anyway, Dr. Carrier, any final words to everybody before we go? Uh, how can people support you? What's the best way to do that? Yeah, check it. Well, my website is the center of everything for me. So uh, richardcarrier.info. Uh, from there, you can find my Facebook, my Twitter. Um, so the best way to support me is to buy my books. Uh, you can take my online courses, uh, so you can find a link to that on my website. Uh, or even better, become a Patreon supporter. So uh, my my patrons actually fund, f what I do is four substantive long-form blogs every month on various subjects, sometimes politics, sometimes philosophy, a lot of history, ancient history stuff, uh, historical method, critical thinking, all those things. Uh, and what you do is, if, if you're a Patreon supporter, you're basically funding these articles to be available to the world without a paywall. So you're basically, you're basically allowing people around the world to access and read this stuff who can't afford it. Uh, so I, I, I really recommend and encourage people to become a patron supporter. Small, trivial amount of money a month uh, to help support this, uh, this cause. It keeps my website up, keeps my articles generated, and, makes, and I try to generate articles that are useful, like the articles you can point people to on subjects, right? Like, say, you know what? Richard Carrier's got an article about that. Here it is. And so if you help as a, as a patron to support that, you, you're creating these articles and making them exist. Is there a way that people can contact you that way as well? If they support you, can they ask a Yeah, question there's a lot or... of perks. I, I should mention there are perks if you're a Patreon supporter. I get a lot of questions and I just don't have time to answer most people. Right. But if you're a patron, uh, I make time. So you just have to remind me that you're a Patreon patron. If you're a paying patron, uh, I will answer your quick questions on Facebook Messenger, for example. Um, 
email will take forever because I don't look at email for weeks at a time, but, um, and I'm way backlogged on email. So email is a terrible way to reach me. Uh, but if you're a Patreon supporter, you get that. You also get to, your comments will publish immediately on my blog. You don't have, they don't go to a moderator queue. Uh, so you get that perk as well. If you write comments on my blog, they immediately get published. Um, if you're a Patreon supporter, you just have to remind me that you are. And then I update the whitelist for, for the particular email address you use in Patreon and it'll get accepted. So uh, that's, uh, there are other perks. You can go check them out uh, at my Patreon, which there's a link to on my website. Thank you so much, Dr. Richard Carrier, everybody. I wish I had a way to go, yay, with a big <laughs> round of applause. But seriously, I always enjoy talking with you, learning from you, and uh, hopefully people will go join your Patreon. Uh, if there is a successful amount of people who join, please let me know. It always makes me feel good about what I do here to try and help. So, right, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, go join it. Ask him questions. Harass him if you want to, as long as you're no, supporting do him. <laughs> You can do it if you support. I mean, come yeah, on. all right, all right. <laughs> throw, throw him a throw him a denari at least for it. Uh, but seriously, let's do this again soon, and I look forward to it. Yeah, you bet. It's always good. Thanks, Derek. Thank you, and never forget, we are Myth Vision. Don't any of you have the guts to play for blood? I'm your huckleberry. That's just my game. Thank you.